a hearing on financial control boards. A House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee held this hearing Wednesday to examine the experience major cities have had with financial control boards. <laughs> a board is being considered for Washington, D.C. to help with the city's current financial situation. This hearing runs about four hours. <coughs> The um, meeting will come to order. I want to welcome all of you to our third hearing on the financial and budgetary crisis faced by the District of Columbia, our nation's capital. These hearings are designed to educate the subcommittee, Congress, the residents and government of the District of Columbia, and the nation on the true financial situation of the district and what other cities in similar situations have done to deal with their problems. Today we will hear from people from three great American cities that experienced tough financial times in recent years, Cleveland, New York, and Philadelphia. By taking the time to be with us today, these distinguished Americans demonstrate their concern for Washington, D.C. as not only another great American city in trouble, but also as our nation's capital. They have come to share their experiences so that we in Congress can learn and hopefully benefit from them. All of the people who will testify shortly have greater experience with control boards and other forms of urban rejuvenation than we have. That is the purpose of today's hearing, to gain insight from people who have actually been there about how these mechanisms work or don't work. Last week, we learned that Washington's problems are not unique. All the other cities we have examined stumbled into the abyss the same way Washington has. They attempted to do too much and lived well beyond their means. The titles of a book and a newspaper article I encountered recently succinctly summarize the causes of these problems. In 1980, Charles R. Morris called his detailed study of uh, the New York fiscal crisis of the 1970s the cost of good intentions. Indeed, Mr. Morris found that the problem was right there in his title. Good intentions alone, without limit or control, are as harmful as bad intentions. Last month, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist William Raspberry headlined a column on Washington, D.C. as the city that couldn't say no. He likened the city's spending practices not to those of a drunken sailor, but to a compassionate parent with a credit card. As Mr. Raspberry wrote, a huge amount of the city's stupendous debt is the result of the local government's effort to do good things it can't afford. Those days must be gone forever. The testimony of so many credible people before us in these three hearings serves as evidence to the people of Washington, D.C. and the people of the surrounding region who all have a stake in the vitality of this city that this can be a beginning rather than an end. The people who are with us today will show that a control board is not a monster or a cure worse than the disease that it is designed to fight. The people and governments of this region, as well as of the District of Columbia itself, need to help resolve the present difficulties. Without the vitality and culture of a healthy Washington, D.C., the Maryland and Virginia suburbs cannot expect their good times to continue unabated either. Control boards in and of themselves cannot solve some of the most pressing ills that plague most of our cities today. High crime, excessive taxes, shrinking tax bases, poor schools, and the loss of the middle class. That will require a partnership of local people from both the public and private sectors with the courage, vision, and imagination to break with past practices devise new and better ways of serving the people who live, work, and visit our urban centers. I know of no other current issue where we can better apply Benjamin Franklin's advice to the Continental Congress. We must all hang together, or we will most assuredly all hang separately. I would yield now to Ms. Norton, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for an opening statement. I'd like to ask other members of the panel to hold any statements they have until later, but I want to acknowledge the presence of the, presence of the chairman of our full committee, uh, Honorable William Klinger, for once again being with us today. Uh, the mayor's on a very tight schedule, and we're just very grateful that he could take time to be with us today. Ms. Norton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Chairman Davis for his leadership in producing two vital hearings in short order as we move to address a fiscal emergency and to prevent default by the District of Columbia. The chairman's course and pace are dictated by dramatic events. Last month, the bond rating agencies downgraded the district's credit rating so severely that for all practical purposes, the district has lost the ability to borrow the money necessary to stay in business. Yet on February 22nd, a week after the first of three agencies downgraded the district's bonds, Mayor Barry testified that the district would need to borrow cash within weeks. 
At the same joint hearing of this subcommittee and the D.C. Appropriations Subcommittee, Mayor Barry testified that the district needed an oversight board. The GAO appeared at that hearing as well and testified that the district is technically insolvent. Emergency conditions are compounded by a deficit significantly larger than previously suspected and by congressionally required cuts that now appear impossible to fully achieve by September 30th, the end of the fiscal year. Thus, the subcommittee is working quickly to establish a recovery board for three reasons. The district is insolvent, the district must borrow soon, and the district has a deficit that is now so far out of control that it cannot be tamed within a single fiscal year. Chairman Davis has said that he believes that the House and the Senate must complete their work by the April recess in case the district must borrow while Congress is out of session. Therefore, he has established a timetable necessary to get the job done. I know that I speak for district officials and residents alike when I express my thanks to the chairman for taking the action necessary to avoid an untenable result. We are racing against the clock. If Congress is to do the job right in so short a period of time, we must submit to a quick study of the real-life operational experience of cities that have established boards. We are enormously grateful that so many of the principal figures who have been active in making their boards work have agreed to testify today. Their testimony is a tangible and invaluable contribution to the nation's capital and thus to the nation itself. I welcome all of today's witnesses and express my sincere gratitude to them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Um, I would now yield to the representative from Staten Island, the former minority leader of the New York City Council, Susan Molinari. Thank you, Chairman Davis. Chairman Davis, members of the committee, it's a great honor and a privilege to introduce to you the mayor of the greatest city in the world, the mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani. Rudy is the best thing that has happened to New York City since Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia cleaned up Tammany Hall. Since taking office in January of 1994, Mayor Giuliani has done what many people claimed was near impossible. He has made city government more efficient, thereby allowing him to reduce the size of government while greatly improving our quality of life. In FY95, the city has implemented plans for an absolute decline in city spending for the first time in over 16 years. And to date, the city-funded workforce has been reduced by over 12,300 employees. I know Mayor Giuliani's leadership and experience in New York City will be helpful to your committee as you work through the District of Columbia's problems to help solve their fiscal crisis. Because the truth is, Mr. Chairman, if you can do it in New York, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> it is my great honor to introduce to the members of this committee the Mayor of the City of New York, Rudolph Giuliani. Thank you. And let me uh, thank you, uh, Susan, for introducing the Mayor. And we appreciate your interest and availability to be with us this morning. Mayor Giuliani, it's a requirement of the committee that all witnesses must be sworn before they may testify. And would you please rise with me and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. you may be seated and proceed with your testimony. And I just say it's an honor to have you here today. And we appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, a privilege for me to be here. Mr. Davis, uh, you're quite correct. All Americans have an interest in Washington, D.C. as a uh, capital and as a great American city. And as one who has had the privilege of living in Washington, D.C., I have a particular interest in it and real fondness for it. Uh, I've come here today um, with two purposes. The first is to address the advisability of implementing a financial control board for cities in crisis, a situation New York faced in the mid-1970s. The second is to discuss the steps my administration has taken to reorder New York City's economy, to reduce government spending, to promote private sector growth, and to improve the quality of life in New York City. The spirit in which I offer both uh, sets of comments are as suggestions. Uh, we don't have all of the answers by any means. Uh, we're struggling with very, very similar problems uh, that Washington, D.C. is struggling with. And I offer these suggestions as some that might be applicable, some that might not and being completely supportive of the work of this committee and of the mayor in uh, trying to uh, get control of a very difficult problem that built up over a long period of time. And I'm sure that if you all work together, uh, you will be able uh, to get control of it. On the subject of a financial control board, 
It certainly can provide service during a time of extreme financial distress, like the situation New York City faced during its fiscal crisis 20 years ago. And it can certainly also provide uh, a great many ideas and uh, the ability and the mechanism to make very, very tough decisions that sometimes uh, elude the political process uh, and unfortunately uh, cannot be made as part of the political process. However, a financial control board should have a very strict beginning and a very strict end. Once the city has regained fiscal discipline, the financial control board can easily become just another layer of bureaucratic oversight. And it can itself become a political tool, just as much as a mayor, a city council, or uh, any other group can become a political tool. I think really the, um, the art to doing it correctly is to have a very strict, tight sunset period so that the uh, control board would exist during the time of emergency and then uh, at uh, a fixed point it would be dissolved so that a city can quickly regain its self-sufficiency. Um, when, when I came into office, I was determined to change the, the direction of New York City and set it on a course for growth and prosperity. The key to accomplishing this was to reorder the city's economy by restoring the proper balance between our public and private sectors. In short, New York City had the largest government economy in the United States, and its private economy was shrinking, hemorrhaging. We had lost over 400,000 private sector jobs in a four-year period. Those are numbers that matched uh, the Great Depression. In order to restructure our economy, we've uh, engaged on a very deliberate course of reducing the size of the public sector, reducing the size of government, and taking some of the money that we save from that and putting it back into the private sector so that we can restore a more balanced economy in the city with a somewhat smaller government and a growing private sector. Last year, our first budget for fiscal year 1995 moved to restore the balance by, for the first time in 16 years, reducing spending in the city of New York. It was the first budget in 16 years in which the city spent less money in one fiscal year than in the year before. In fact, the city had been on a course over a 40 or 50 year period of each year spending more money uh, than in the year before. Part of the reason why the city created a structural deficit is that if you go back and trace each one of those periods, what you see is that as the mayor and the city council would get ready to set the budget for the next year, they would increase the budget and then during the year, they would spend even more than the amount by which they increased it. So let's say they agreed to increase the budget by 6%. That would be voted by the city council, agreed to by the mayor. And then over the course of the year, that 6% increase in one way or another would become an 11 or 12% increase in spending. That had occurred roughly for 16 consecutive years. It had been interrupted by two years of a financial control board, in essence, running the affairs of the city and that had gone on for the previous 20 or 30 years. The problem with it is, in almost every single year, the increase in spending was greater than the increase in the size of the economy. So the city was outspending the growth of its economy. If the economy of the city was growing by 5%, the city would somehow find a way to spend 10%. If the economy was growing in a bad year by 2 or 3, even then the city would find a way to spend 5 or 6%. All of that converts itself into a kind of technocrat uh, label called structural deficit, but structural deficit means that you, you are spending considerably more money than your tax base can really allow you. And then we would do things like raising taxes, raising fees, raising fines, and we were crushing the private sector. In essence, giving it a very strong me message to get out of New York City, because if you stay in New York City, you're going to continue to pay for our inability to spend within our means. So we embarked on a three-pronged approach to um, redress the city's imbalance. And the first one might seem a little, bit, um, a little bit off the point, but probably has the most to do with uh, creating um, economic redevelopment. The first priority was to make our streets and neighborhoods safer, to increase policing, to increase it as dramatically as possible, and to show that New York City could reduce crime and reduce it quickly. Over the last year, New York City experienced one of the largest reductions in crime in its history, and in two categories, murder and felonious assault, it achieved the largest reduction ever in the history of the city. And New York City now is below 
the top 50 cities for crime in the United States. That's vitally important because no matter what you do with, with, the, uh, with the taxes and no matter what you do with the balance in the economy, if people believe that a city is not safe, they're going to leave it. And you can't have economic development when people are fleeing. The second thing that we did was to create an aggressive pro-business environment because businesses mean jobs. And the fact is that we were looking to the wrong place for jobs. The city was promising jobs from government. New York City has seven and a half to eight million people, officially. We employ, when you consider our employment and the number of people that come into the city every day to work, you're talking about more like 10 or 11 million people. Even a government that was as large as New York City's and New York State's can only supply jobs for a couple hundred thousand people. It's the private sector that can supply the job needs of millions and millions of people. And offering the false promise of government jobs, the city was crushing the real hope of jobs in the private sector. And the changes that we made in the budget have reversed that trend. The third thing that we did was to restore fiscal stability in our city government by substantially reducing the actual dollars spent and by reducing the size of the workforce to bring the private the public economy in line with the private economy. And all three of these priorities really work uh, together. By working cooperatively with the unions and not engaging in layoffs, but implementing a severance plan, we were able to reduce the size of the city workforce by now approximately 15,000. By the end of this fiscal year, the reduction will be somewhere in the range of 20,000. When the city went through the fiscal crisis of the 1970s, that's approximately the amount that the city reduced the workforce by in the same period of time. Then it was 21,000. But at that time, the city did it through layoffs. What they did was, using civil service rules and seniority rules, just across the board, reduced dramatically the size of city agencies by firing people. But when the city does that, given the civil service rules we operate under, you can't make choices about who you remove and who you don't remove. You have to do it by seniority. And sometimes, half the people you're removing are your very best workers. Instead of doing that, we entered into very, very uh, intense negotiations with all of the city unions. And we offered severance programs, dollars, and help to people to encourage them to leave city service. By doing that, we were able to target the agencies we wanted to reduce, rather than having to reduce all agencies. We were even able to go one step further than that, which is to target the areas where we felt we had excess employees rather than having to reduce across the board. Across the board reductions really just end up uh, creating more expenses later because you have to hire back the people uh, that you fired or laid off. So I would suggest in uh, determining uh, how you're going to reduce a workforce that you have to be able to negotiate or create the legal mechanism in which there's the flexibility to make different choices. You may not want to reduce the size of a police department when you have hundreds, hundreds of thousands of felonies in a year. Uh, so you may want to uh, keep the police department at roughly the level that it's at. There may be another agency in which you want to make reductions. Uh, and even within an agency, you don't necessarily want to do it across the board. Uh, so the end result is we've been able to reduce the city workforce by the most that it's been reduced probably in any year in a very, very long time. And we've been able to do it so far without having to fire anyone or lay any, anyone off. And the process is uh, continuing. For example, we uh, successfully negotiated two contracts with two different unions, uh, one the Sanitation Workers Union and the other the School Custodians Union. One of those unions had a clause in its contract that prevented even consideration of privatization, the Sanitation Workers Union. We negotiated, had that clause removed, said that we were willing to discuss and look at privatization. And I can tell you that um, the result of that has been more productivity, much harder work, and a great many um, uh, benefits that the city has been able to get back from the union as a result of being willing to consider privatization. The city had previously put itself in the untenable position of agreeing to a contractual language that said not only would the city not privatize the sanitation services, but for some strange reason, the language read something like the city would not even consider privatization. This was even this was sort of an attempt to even stop thinking. So um, by opening again the possibility of privatization, the very best result that you can actually bring about happened. The uh, thought of competition has led to significant productivity gains 
actual dollar savings to the city and um, uh, a number of other things that in increased uh, service. In our first year, we've uh, privatized 60 different uh, areas of city government, including parks maintenance, street resurfacing, vehicle maintenance, schools custodian and maintenance services, firehouse cleaning, and all the homeless services that previously had been owned and operated by New York City, we are now aggressively moving out to the private not-for-profit sector. As I pointed out before with sanitation workers, we don't always make the choice in favor of privatization. Sometimes the thought of privatization or the competition that it offers means that public employees work much more effectively, much more efficiently, and you get the same savings or even more, but in order to create that mechanism, you have to be willing to privatize and you have to be willing to make the choice in favor of privatization. If you take it off the table and you don't do it, then the negotiations aren't going to happen. Um, consolidation can work uh, just as well. For example, New York City has um, the largest police department in the United States, and then it has two other separate police departments. We had a, a New York City police department of 31,000, a transit police, and a housing police. Uh, sometimes they work together, sometimes they didn't work together, and they triplicate administrative functions so that we had three different budget offices, three different personnel offices, three different public relations offices, which I should point out to you in the case of the New York City Police Department, the public relations and press office was larger than the president's public relations and press office, the State Department, or uh, the mayor's. It was twice the size of the mayor's. And then the other two police departments had their own. By achieving a merger of the three police departments, uh, we will be able to significantly downsize the number of police offices that are used as public relations people, uh, budget experts, labor negotiators, and move them out into functions that have them policing, which ultimately saves the city money. We recently presented the budget for fiscal year 1996. And that budget also, once again, offers um, a reduced level of city spending, significantly reduced level of city spending. And again, the reason for that is because we have to reduce the size of city spending so that we can invest some of that money in the private sector. Uh, we have uh, so far reduced uh, several taxes in the city that were uh, significant inhibitors of economic growth, uh, the most significant of which was probably the hotel occupancy tax. And it is a good object lesson in what targeted tax reduction can do. New York City's hotel occupancy tax was the largest in the country, 21 and a quarter percent. For 18 straight months, one of the magazines that services the travel industry each month had an advertisement in it that said that you should boycott New York City because it has the highest hotel occupancy tax in the world. Uh, many, many people and many agents did boycott New York City, and we lost hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in business. The city and state last year reduced the hotel occupancy tax. Our hotel occupancy tax now is competitive with the hotel occupancy tax in the 20 largest cities in the United States. And I'm very, very uh, happy to say that the end result is that we had our best year for tourism in a long time last year. We're on our way to our best ever. And with the lower hotel occupancy tax, we will collect more money than we did with the higher hotel occupancy tax, which is a good object lesson in what tax reduction can do if you do it in a targeted and sensible way. I could give you similar examples with the commercial rent tax and some of the other areas in which we've either reduced taxes or we're planning uh, to do it. During this period of time, a significant reduction of government jobs, which was about 15,000 so far, it's going to go up to 20,000. Very interesting thing happened on the private side of the economy. For the first time in four or five years, New York City experienced job growth on the private side of the economy of about 30,000. So for the first time in a long time, New York City government decreased, but the private sector began uh, to grow. And ultimately, uh, that's the place in which you're going to supply the job needs of young, young people. Uh, that process is a process that has to be considered in what you're doing, because a city can't just downsize. A city has to downsize for the purpose of restoring its economy and creating economic growth. Otherwise, the downsizing just becomes a, uh, a constantly escalating uh, process. And the choices have to be made in favor of not only downsizing, but taking the money you save from that and putting it back into the private economy 
so that you keep jobs, retain jobs, and have a good argument for people bringing businesses to your city because they can make and see the possibility of making uh, a, a profit. So these are some of the things that, that, uh, that we've done uh, that I think have worked well so far. Starting on January 1st of this year, we began taking on the second part of New York City's budget that uh, helped to create the structural deficit, which is the enormous expenditures on entitlement programs, which are out of line with the rest of the country, sometimes by factors of three and four to one, sometimes as high as six to one. On January 1st, we initiated a workfare program, the first really in New York City, where uh, we now require able-bodied individuals to work 20 hours a week in exchange for their benefits. Uh, that again was also negotiated with the municipal labor unions because what we had to do, given the very extensive collective bargaining agreements that we have, we had to convince them that we were going to assign people who were on welfare to jobs that wouldn't otherwise be available for uh, union workers, jobs that actually weren't being done by the city any longer. And we found those jobs in the transportation department in uh, dealing with roads and public spaces. We found those jobs in the sanitation department dealing with snow removal and trash removal. We found those jobs in the parks department in cleaning and, uh, and ma maintaining the parks of the city and in many, many other areas. So that when a person applied for welfare benefits, unless that person was disabled or there was some other uh, reason, if the person was an able-bodied person who could work, the person would be assigned to a, a work assignment the next day. And that work assignment would be for about 20 or 23 hours a week, which, uh, which is the limit uh, that is imposed by state law. Uh, this is the largest uh, workfare program in the United States, ongoing workfare program in the United States. And although it's only been in operation for a few months, we're already seeing very, very dramatic results as a, uh, as a result of it. We're also very confident that if um, we can demonstrate that workfare can work in New York, workfare can work anywhere, given the uh, climate in New York and the difficulty in people accepting it uh, to start with. Nothing is more fundamental to the philosophy of uh, my administration than the goal of providing jobs for people, because I think jobs are the only, is really the only social program that ultimately really works to complete someone's life. And I think that uh, a city has to understand that in the way you make choices with the size of your government, you can either retard or expand the possibilities of, uh, of jobs. Uh, finally, maybe the most important area in which we've made uh, a good deal of change is in convincing the bureaucracies in the city and the commissioners who run those bureaucracies that they, in fact, can manage more effectively with considerably less people. That uh, the notion that you could not reduce the number of government employees and maintain services or even improve services is a notion that ignores the fact that city government is inefficient. Let's assume that everyone, everyone in my city, I think, would be willing to agree, no matter what their political philosophy or attitudes, that city government was operating at a rate of inefficiency of at least 15 or 20 percent. And the art of governing is to find that 15 or 20 percent and remove it. And what you find when you do that is people do find that they can manage with fewer people, that they then start initiating different ways of managing that, where they can get more out of it and they can deliver better services at a lower price. It creates a dynamic of people taking on more initiative for themselves. Um, the area in which we've had the most dramatic change is in the crime reduction. And one of the reasons for that is that the New York City Police Department today is managed differently than it was managed a year and a half ago. It's managed for the specific purpose of reducing crime. Previously, we used to use crime statistics as a historical device. Every three months or every six months, we would put out statistics that explain whether murders were going up or down, whether rapes were going up or down, whether assaults were going up or down. Then the FBI would do it once a year, and the city would either look like it was getting safer or getting more dangerous. Now we use crime statistics to manage the New York City Police Department in the same way that you would use a profit and loss statement to manage a corporation. Every single day, the police commissioner has presented to him the crime statistics for every precinct in the city. It shows up to that point in the year whether there are more murders or less murders, more assaults or less, more robberies, car thefts or less. Each week he and I review it. And then we make choices about deploying our police department specifically for the purpose of reducing crime. 
if we see that there's a growth in felonious assault in a particular area, we then will put more police officers there. If we see there's a growth in car theft in a particular area of the city, we'll put more police officers there. It's important because um, previously the police department was really managed from the point of view of just making arrests. And if you're managed from that point of view, then the fact is you make arrests that may or may not reduce crime, and you don't deploy police officers, let's say, just for policing in particular areas where they're not going to make arrests, but where they may have the effect of reducing crime. By now changing that to managing for the purpose of reducing crime, a precinct commander has a strong incentive to put police officers in areas where he may not come back with the result of arrests, but he will come back with a 10 or 12 percent reduction in the number of thefts that take place or the number of assaults that take place or the number of car thefts that take place. I think that's one of the reasons why the city had historic reductions in crime last year. And I can tell you, because I see the st statistics once a week, that those numbers are getting greater this year. Um, part of accomplishing what has to be accomplished in American cities is incorporating in the way in which we manage cities the principles that you would learn from private business. Many American corporations have gone through massive turnarounds in the last three, four, or five years. The principles that they've utilized are the principles that we're utilizing. Severance programs rather than firing. Determining the results that you want to achieve and managing and setting up statistical indicators so that you manage for that purpose. And finally, getting over the hurdle and the fear that takes place uh, so that the idea of doing more with less becomes a very exciting dynamic of how you can actually deliver better services, how people can take on more responsibilities, do more things, and uh, actually turn around the way government views itself. Uh, much of what we're doing is incorporated in Osborne's book called Reinventing Government. Uh, we, think, we think that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we do know that there's a tremendous amount more to be done, and we're very, very happy to help in any way that we can, either with the things that have worked that might help in the District of Columbia, or we're certainly happy to tell you the things that don't work because not everything works uh, so, you, so that you can avoid some of our mistakes. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that is, I think, really inspiring a testimony. I think good news for, for, for citizens here that there is hope at the end of uh, what is right now a very, very difficult time for the city. I want to ask just a couple of questions before I pass it over for questions from some of our other uh, panel, our committee members. Uh, I take it the control board, you're saying, if it stays too long, sometimes they can get in the way of innovation, stop you from doing your job if it's, uh, is, that, is that fair? Anything that stays too long gets in the way of innovation, and control boards are no different than anything else. The fact is that um, for a year or two years or three years, a control board operating in an emergency can be enormously valuable. It can offer good ideas. It can offer the support and even the mechanism for making unpalatable political choices. Then after a while, it becomes part of the whole uh, process and becomes a player in the political process. Uh, and therefore, I think it's an excellent idea, but it's one that if you do it, you should have a strict sunset provision, and you should review it frequently to make sure you still need it. Because if you keep it too long, it becomes a political mechanism, and then it deprives the city of showing that it can be self-sufficient. Thank you uh, very much. Um, in, in your talk about really making sure the government's not the employer of last resorts, but letting the private sector do more and your uh, tax initiatives that have helped keep business in the city and bring it into the city, um, it's been a net creation of jobs, where is it looked like in the old days with the city the employer of last resort, you were losing jobs each year. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, uh, American corporations and businesses are very sophisticated. They do very detailed analyses of where they should be located. And if a city is presenting a financial picture in which the debt of the city is the thing that's increasing the most, well, if you run a business or I run a business, we look at that and we come to the conclusion that we're going to pay for that debt. And yeah. if you, you see a city that's going in the other direction, you're kind of inclined to move your business there. But the pro-jobs initiatives that you put forward in the city, now, is that at the expense of the suburbs or does that help the whole region as you take a look at that? N no doubt helps the whole region. Uh, New York City accounts for 40 percent of the income of people who live in the two uh, surrounding counties of New York State, Westchester and Nassau County. Uh, so in essence, and we tax it, so uh, this, is, this is a two-way street. Uh, they, the Nassau County and Westchester County, County benefit, and we 
and we get resources uh, from it. But we're in this together. And one of the things that I did uh, shortly upon uh, being elected is set up a Metropolitan Regional Council. I meet on a regular basis with the county executives in the surrounding suburban counties, uh, Nassau, Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, and Rockland. And what we try to do is to have as many areas of agreement as possible so that we deal with the state government together very often for things that are of benefit to all of us. But the result really, if this, as the way it's worked out is the whole region in terms of net jobs for the region goes up. You're Absolutely not just right. rating if each other, you're making the region more economically uh, attractive. Absolutely. If jobs grow in Manhattan, it helps the suburban counties because many of the people that, that work in Manhattan live in those counties. Many live in the city. Uh, by the same token, if jobs grow in Nassau County, even if the people who are living in Nassau County, they come to shows in New York City, they come to restaurants in New York City. When we have baseball, hopefully again, <laughs> real baseball, they come and watch the Mets and the Yankees play in large numbers. So this is something where we benefit each other. That's great. Th thank you very much. And I, I could spend all day just talking to you. I think it's great what you're doing up there. And I appreciate you being here. I'm going to yield now to uh, Ranking Minority Member uh, Ms. Norton. Thanks, is that okay? Really thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I want to I get straight, uh, 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 Mayor Giuliani, about when, what your relationship is to what I would almost call a kind of post-control board period. Um, what is the continuing relationship between New York City and the control board or the Big Mac? I think along with the, my two predecessors, um, would be Mayor Koch and Mayor Dinkins, uh, I don't see the need for the Financial Control Board any longer for the City of New York. Uh, the, uh, the, the measures that I just described to you in reducing spending in the city, reducing jobs in the city, uh, was something that uh, we brought about as part of my administration. The Control Board didn't recommend it. Uh, the Control Board didn't bring it about. There was a Control Board for 10 or 12 years before I took office, and they weren't able to bring about any of those changes and kind of watched while the city, uh, city spending grew way out of line with the uh, level of the economy in the city. So I think the control board performed an enormously valuable function during the emergency the city faced in the 1970s. But I think at some point it became just another part of the political apparatus of the, si of the state and either performed no particularly useful function, sometimes it would perform a political function. And if it politically agreed with uh, the mayor, it would be very laudatory, and if it didn't, it would be uh, derogatory. So I think that the caution that I would give is control boards work really well during emergencies. Then they become like every other political apparatus. Are they, are they on a standby basis essentially for all practical purposes now? And not yes, they are, they are on a standby uh, basis, but m most people don't realize that and recognize that. So when they issue analyses, some of which are helpful and some of which are useless, those analyses get the, uh, get the same uh, weight that they would get during the period of time in which uh, there was an emergency. Uh, Mayor Giuliani, you are given uh, uh, real credit for um, uh, tackling the uh, large deficit you found when you came into office. And I know the kind of credit you're given because um, Sandy Levinson and Al Shanker, <laughs> your uh, school board czars, uh, were in Washington recently. And um, I uh, was at the dinner table with them. And I said, uh, how y'all getting along with uh, Rudy Giuliani? And uh, without going into detail, what they had to say was praiseworthy. Um, what interests, uh, and they, they remarked, especially upon your use of buyouts or what you call the severance plan, uh, the district did not attempt those buyouts until too late, virtually, until the Congress had already ordered court cuts, um, depended on layoffs uh, a couple of years ago. That got a huge rise out of the workers. That intimidated the city. Uh, and um, buyouts uh, were going on in the federal government, but somehow the city did not begin that process early enough. But what interests me is that after New York went through this uh, extraordinary crisis where you let go 60,000 people in, in no time flat, it appears that New York City grew back its <laughs> government. 
and that something <laughs> like a returning crisis occurred and you were faced with something not unlike what a beam faced uh, and you have had to tackle that. I'd like to know, one, why did it grow back? And two, how can one make this thing permanent, everlasting, and over with? Uh, so <laughs> so it never, you never have to go through what you're now having to go your, through again. Your analysis is ex exactly correct. And um, sometimes I compare it to someone who has gone through the uh, difficult process of losing a tremendous amount of weight and then gaining it all back again. <laughs> and boy, it's real hard then to do it again, but then you're going to have to do it again. The fact is, and I, I think I can trace this because I used to have a chart, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it with me, that really demonstrates this. New York City's fiscal crisis was roughly in 1975. And if I just used a number of employees, it would probably tell the story. At that time, New York City had official, direct employees of the city, about 240,000 employees. Between 1975 to about 1982, New York City, with a financial control board, and the financial control board, for a lot of that, operating with full powers, New York City reduced from about 240,000 to about 185,000 employees. So you see the chart go all the way down. Starting in 1982 to 1983, New York City started moving up dramatically because as prosperity of the 80s happened, Rather than investing at least some of that prosperity in tax reduction, the city didn't reduce taxes. The city actually increased some taxes and just kept saying yes to everything. And yes to even things that nobody was even asking about. <laughs> so it went from 82 to 83 till about 1987, 88, moved up to about 220,000 again. And then, if you actu actually do an apples to apples comparison, because some of these jobs had been moved out to quasi-government agencies. Uh, in 1990, when I became mayor, New York City was on its way to having 250,000 employees. So in essence, we had done all the downsizing, we had fired all of those people, we had laid all of those people off, and you can see a similar thing happening in the rest of city services. And then we built way back up, and the cost of those employees in 1987, 88, 89, and 90 was much greater than it was in 1975. So now we're going through the same thing all over again. Now we've taken the city workforce, now it's on its way down to about 201,000. The next budget will take it down to about 195,000, and the one after it about 185, 187,000. So you are right, we're going through the same process all over again. It also, I think, underscores the way to use a financial control board, when it works and when it doesn't work. Financial control bo board worked really well during the time of crisis. Kept the pressure on the city to reduce the workforce, to be efficient, to renegotiate agreements with labor unions. As the Financial Control Board became more of the political apparatus of the city, it did no good in 1983, 84, 85. It was there while the city gained all the weight back again. So the real art here is a short period, a real emergency, let it exercise power, and then the city itself has to politically learn the mechanism for saying no. And it has to become politically, I see it, very often as a political plus to say no, because the people of the city are sophisticated enough to understand that if you continually say yes, you're just pandering and ultimately hurting them. The chairman's called my time. I just want to finish this off by saying that uh, I I if the control board during this uh, time when it was, was uh, becoming more and more dormant had uh, helped the city recognize that a permanent range of employees is what they should continually strive for, then I take it we would not have had. They would have performed a useful function by calling that to the city's attention, and then you wouldn't have had the government grow mm -hmm. back just to have to be reduced again. Or if they had followed a rule of growth in spending no greater than the uh, rate of inflation or some standard that would have created a, uh, a break on it. The city, the city in 1983, 84, 85, and it could spend more money. It was going through tremendous prosperity. But if it had had some discipline about the amount that it was spending and had it invested some of it in tax reduction so that the private sector could also grow, I don't think we'd be experiencing the difficulties we're experiencing now. Thank you very much. I'd like to now call on the uh, chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Klinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, 
Mayor Giuliani, I, I want to commend you for the uh, outstanding job you've done in, in turning the city around and doing some very, making some very tough calls to make that happen, and I think you uh, deserve uh, a lot of credit for having accomplished that. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, I think uh, you indicated that uh, you have reversed the outflow of uh, businesses uh, from the city. Uh, is that correct? I mean, you, you're now yes, sir. actually attracting uh, new businesses in. Uh, one of the, you know, the number of proposals here is to how we can reverse that in the District of Columbia because we've had an, a lot of outflow from the district to uh, some pretty extreme things like sort of declaring the whole district an enterprise zone or basically uh, making it a commonwealth or a whole range of things. Uh, do you think we need to be that extreme to, to accomplish the kind of reverse trend that, uh, that you've seen in New York? I, I really don't know the, the details of it. My guess is you would not have to be that there are three major things that any business looks to as to whether or not they want to stay where they are or go somewhere else or come to a new place. And safety is one. Uh, the tax structure is the second one. And then maybe emerging from that and other things, just a general impression of whether this is a city that's going to grow or contract. And if they have a sense that this is a growth area, then they're going to want to stay there. Uh, I think the most important thing is to get the city in tune with the economic principles that drive job creators, rather than having them do things that are inconsistent with the principles that are used by people who create jobs. People who create jobs own businesses. And if you sh can show them that their lot is going to improve, then you're going to keep jobs in the city. If you do the opposite of that, if you do everything imaginable to show them that their lot's going to get worse, then being sensible human beings, they leave. If, they, if you have a business, you're producing jobs, and you're in a city in which crime is getting worse, the quality of life is, is decreasing, you're being charged more money to live there, then you say to yourself, well, this is a place I want to leave. If they see that reversing and changing, you'll see job growth increase. The District of Columbia is a very desirable place to locate a business. Uh, government is here. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why you would want to be in the District of Columbia. So you have to be doing things two businesses that aggressively hurt them in order to drive them out. You change that, and you're going to keep a lot of businesses here, and a lot of businesses will want to come here. Uh, just one uh, other question. Uh, one of the most serious problems that we have in the district is the, uh, the enormous uh, shortfall in the Medicaid uh, situation and uh, how we're going to address that. The mayor would like uh, us to step in and, and uh, help finance that. I think there's uh, not a tremendous amount of enthusiasm at the moment for that. Uh, course of action, but how, what has been the, uh, the uh, situation in New York? How have you addressed uh, the Medicaid? We, we have very, very similar uh, difficulty. New York City spends $2.4 billion on Medicaid. Uh, it's the largest single line item expenditure unless you consider the Board of Education, and it's the thing that's increased the most in the last several years. Uh, this is a shared responsibility. I think the city government, the state government, and the federal government None of them are doing what they should do about Medicaid. In the case of the city, we weren't doing what we should do about cost containment. Uh, we were selecting every option. We were saying no to virtually uh, none of the things that were ever presented. Uh, we were maintaining hospitals, public hospitals, at levels of um, numbers of employees way beyond the number of beds that were actually occupied in the hospital. We have hospitals that are 65% occupied they were being staffed for 95 percent. So some of the problem we were creating for ourselves. In this budget that I presented, we do a major cutback of about $800 million in what the city is spending. Second part of it is, in New York, in New, York uh, New York City has to pay 25 percent of the cost of Medicaid. It's the only city in the country that's required to do that, which is something I'm trying to change with the state government. And the reimbursement rate by the federal government is only 50 percent. Both of those could also should be adjusted. But I see this as a three-way thing. I mean, we should be doing more, and we should also be treated equitably a little bit differently by the state and the federal government. We should be doing more means we should be doing a lot more cost containment. What I've done is to dramatically step up Medicaid managed care. The city of New York now has about 20 percent of its Medicaid recipients in managed care programs. That 20 percent results in a savings of about 15% over the other 80% that are in Medicaid. 
Uh, we're going to try to get to about 90% in a two-year period. If we do that, we think we can save a tremendous amount of money. But what we'd like to do with that savings is to see if the state government can return half of those savings to us uh, so that we can use it and have discretion over it. Thank you very much. I'm thank you. Now, uh, thank, thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Uh, re recognize our ranking uh, member of the minority party, Mrs. Uh, Collins. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, the powers of the financial control boards have ranged from direct control over revenues, expenditures, and borrowing to merely exercise of review and disapproval authority. And so my first question is what mix of oversight and control power do you believe to be the most effective? Now, I think the uh, oversight and control has to keep uh, ultimate responsibility in the hands of the mayor and the city council. Otherwise, you don't bring about the change that you want to bring about. If the financial control board were to run the city, then at some point when it stopped running the city, you'd just be going back into the same set of problems that you had before. Uh, what you should be trying to do is have the financial control board available for the emergency to help with some of the very tough decisions that have to be made. But ultimately, those decisions should have to be made by the mayor and the city council. They can use the financial control board as a device to get this done because some of these things will be very politically unpopular. And you have to really think out how long a period and then how you're going to return things to the normal political, to the normal political structure. Which leads to another one of my questions. If a financial control board, say, would have uh, uh, oversight for independent borrowing authority, for example, uh, who would be the one to say who has responsibility for any debt that they might incur uh, if the board's term of existence were to expire? Would it go directly to the mayor or to nobody, in fact? No, it really should be, it would have to be assumed by the city government. And I would think long and hard before I would give them independent borrowing authority. What about spending authority? Same, same type of question. Same type of question. I think what they should do is perform a very, very strict oversight role, provide the ability for recommendations and decisions, set parameters for reductions that have to be made, uh, and then at a certain point, if the city's budget remains out of balance, then there would be additional power that the Financial Control Board could maintain. But the first effort should be to try to work with the mayor and the city council to, in essence, move things toward, uh, toward fiscal stability. And then if that doesn't happen, then there would be additional power that the Financial Control Board could, um, could exercise. Because I think what you're going to find is that um, the mayor and the city council uh, will want to work with the Financial Control Board if you, if you do it in the right way. Well, what role would you see the boards playing in assisting city officials in structuring uh, new contracts or benefit packages for the city's workforce? Labor negotiations are uh, like a ma major exercise that nobody really understands from the outside. They happen, they happen on the inside. Uh, the Financial Control Board can play a very useful role by making it clear how much money really exists, how much is really there. And maybe from my own experience, or experience that we've had in the last year and a half, uh, it would have been impossible for us to restructure New York City without the cooperation of the municipal labor unions. Could not have been done, at least not that quickly. And the way in which we obtain their cooperation, and it isn't 100% cooperation, is by being open and straight with them about how much money was available and how much money wasn't available. We opened the books of the city to them. We allowed their experts to come in. We allowed them to examine how much money we had uh, because our contention was that we didn't have money for raises and that we needed, give, in essence, we needed benefits given back to us. And we obtained about $1.2 billion last year in benefits that we were able to negotiate back to the city. We did that because they were convinced that we weren't fooling them. They were convinced that the room wasn't there. They were also convinced that if they didn't do it, then the layoffs would have been massive. And they would be dealing with their membership with a very, very severe problem. I think that's the core that has to happen. Uh, the municipal labor leaders have to, un have to be convinced that someone isn't playing a game with them. Because unfortunately, the history, and I, I can't say this is so for the district, the history might be that in the past, games were played with them. They were, they were asked for reductions or they were denied raises, and then it turned out that the city had a surplus four months later, and there was money that was hidden away. And what we had to go through was a process of convincing them that that was not going on now, 
A financial control board can really help in that regard because it can give an independent assessment of that. It can uh, independently explain to the public and to the union leaders what's available, what isn't available, what the parameters are. It can be independently certified. And if you just think about it from the point of view of a union official who's no different than uh, you are or I am, okay. they get elected. Uh, it's important even for their membership to understand that they are negotiating the best they can negotiate given the realities. Financial Control Board makes that possible. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. I now recognize our Vice Chairman of our committee, uh, gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Goodnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, being here. Your, your testimony has been excellent, and uh, we appreciate it more than you know. Through your experience, and th these are kind of tough questions, and I'm not sure if you can really help us, but uh, I'm wondering, there's pretty much a consensus now that we're going to have to have some kind of a control board here in Washington, D.C. I'm wondering if you could offer any insights in terms of the kinds of people we should be looking for uh, to be on that board, uh, if you have any specific recommendations in terms of the number of people who should be on that board. And, and finally, and this is probably the most difficult one of all, how do you know when it's time to terminate the board? Uh, or do you have any specific suggestions uh, in those regards? The number is really, um, really a question of the talent that you can attract. If there are uh, four or five or six really good people, then uh, that would be the number. I think they have to have a mix of experience. Some have to have political experience. And they have to understand how politics operates. Uh, some can be uh, purely experts in budgeting and in uh, city government or government in general. But a mix of uh, people, including some that understand government and how it operates, and that, um, and that there is a level of give and take and negotiating that has to go on. Uh, as far as how you determine when it sunsets, uh, you, you can probably set up uh, numerical criteria for that. If the uh, deficit is a um, billion dollars and you get to the point where you've removed it or you've gotten close to removing it, uh, then, uh, then, then you no longer need a financial control board. And uh, probably you should review it every year or two years to determine how close you're getting to that goal. Uh, structural, I also would uh, strongly recommend, and I'm not certain if this is done in the District of Columbia, it isn't done in, in uh, many state governments. I would strongly recommend, and the Financial Control Board uh, really gets the credit for putting the city on this basis, of doing not just a budget, but a financial plan. Uh, what that means is your budget should really be spread out over a four-year period, so that when you do the budget for this year, uh, we really go through a two-step process. I haven't done a budget for next year yet. What I've done is a financial plan. In uh, early February, the mayor is required to put out a four-year financial plan in which I do a tentative budget for the next fiscal year and for the three that follow that. Then we debate that, and then I submit a budget for the next fiscal year. Now, the reason that's important is, and the Financial Control Board can play a big role in this, is it, sho it shows you the implications of your spending in future fiscal years. It also shows you when uh, gimmicks or tricks are being used, where someone is selling uh, an asset and taking the benefit of that in just one fiscal year. You're not going to have that asset available for the next fiscal year or the one after that. So one of, the, one of the benefits that emerge from a financial control board is changing some of those practices. Now, interestingly, in, the, in New York, the city of New York does that. Because of the fiscal crisis, this additional level of review has been imposed, which I think is very valuable, but it hasn't been done for, uh, for the state. It's a, it's a very valuable exercise, and it shows you in future years if you're moving towards structural balance or you're just creating the effect of it in one fiscal year only to make things worse in the next. Thank you. You back? You back? I yield back. All right. Thank you. I now recognize the uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latourette. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And in light of the, uh, the mayor's schedule and uh, the fact that his testimony has already answered so many questions, I, I won't ask any questions, but I will make one observation. One is that uh, when GAO testified before this committee last week, I was struck by the fact that they had indicated that New York City was actually reducing taxes at the same time it faced a, a budget deficit situation. 
and you've reconfirmed that here again today. And uh, what a revolutionary idea uh, to uh, to actually reduce taxes and and uh, have a model in New York City to demonstrate that you can uh, uh, benefit uh, jobs creation and uh, the economy in general. And it's something we should probably uh, try to copy here in Washington, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, uh, gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Flanagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I also will forego a question uh, in lieu of an observation. And thank you for coming here, Mayor. Your your, <laughs> your testimony has has been enlightening. Uh, I'm from Chicago. Mrs. Collins is from Chicago. Many people here are, uh, represent large metropolitan areas, and it's always uh, wonderful to have that insight, not just on this side of the panel, but on on that side as well. Uh, the, the work that you're doing to create a pro-business environment in, in creating private sector investment in the form of tax cuts, I think you bring a practical example of that here and how that actually works and how that you can increase not only the actual raw dollars coming in but the local financial investment by the private sector which creates jobs which drives the city uh, in its vibrance. Uh, further, the entitlement programs, the work fair being the largest in the nation and only a few months old is a testament to the ability to be able to have a plan and execute it in a timely fashion. And um, the reduction in employees that you're moving toward is, is something that will provide absolutely a lesson learned uh, in, in the governance of, of the capital and, and how we can improve our financial condition here. And I, I want to thank you for coming here and, and thank you, Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I know you are on a tight schedule. We, I just want to thank you for being here. To, to Mrs. Molinari, she is one of our stars here in the House. We are pleased to have her here to introduce you. And I want to thank, uh, thank both of you for being here. Mr. Mayor, thanks for your willingness to be with us, share your experience and thoughts on a very difficult issue. Uh, I know you are working very hard to battle problems in New York. Your appearance here today, uh, we consider, as we consider the problems of the nation's capital, are going to help us with the unenviable task ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, the insightful questions. Um, the fact is that uh, Congresswoman Molinari is even a bigger star in New York City okay. than here. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we're very, very proud of her and very proud of all of the good work that she's doing. And if there's any way in which we can help, I, I really want to emphasize that the spirit of this testimony is uh, to offer suggestions. Some of these things work, some don't work. We're all struggling with the same problem. And we want to be supportive of the mayor, the city council, and all of you in this very important effort. Washington, D.C. is a very important city to all of us. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. We have our next panel. Uh, Steve, I'm going to call on you to introduce our next uh, panel member. I'm going to, uh, at this time, recognize a gentleman from Ohio to introduce our next uh, distinguished panelist, uh, Mr. Lazarette. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it's my pleasure to welcome Governor Voinovich to this uh, subcommittee hearing today to testify on the benefits of establishing an oversight and control board in cities facing uh, financial crisis. Unfortunately for the governor, uh, he took over the uh, city of Cleveland as mayor in 1979 at the height of the city's financial crisis. The previous administration had defaulted on $15 million worth of notes owed to local banks, and the city had seen its access to credit markets eliminated. Fortunately for our city, uh, Cleveland, the new mayor proved to be just the man for the job by working closely with the Cleveland Financial Planning and Supervision Commission and by developing a three-year financial recovery plan that took a hard-line stance on expenditures and emphasized a balanced budget as the way to get the city out of default. Then Mayor Voinovich guided Cleveland back to economic health. I think I mentioned uh, prior to the last hearing one of my favorite quotes uh, of the mayor, now our governor, uh, upon assuming this challenge, he said, this is a tough job and I'm not going to submit to the political pressures that mayors have in the past if it means I don't get elected in two years from now, tough. In fact, the mayor did such a good job in restoring the econ economic soundness to the city of Cleveland, he was reelected five times, which is a record uh, for Cleveland mayors. As Mayor George Voinovich received national recognition for his management of our city, the National Urban League named him as one of uh, four distinguished urban mayors in the country. In 1987, City and State Magazine selected him as uh, one of the top three mayors in the nation and named him the All-Pro City Management Team. Additionally, Governor Voinovich has served as a board member of the National League of Cities, and he served as that organization's president in 1985. Mr. Chairman, I don't think that we are any longer uh, considering if 
we are going to recommend an oversight board for the District of Columbia. I believe we are trying to determine what shape that board will take. This hearing will go a long way in helping this committee come to that determination, and I believe that Governor Voinovich's testimony as someone who has shepherded a major city through similar circumstances will be a vital component to that determination, and I very much look forward to his testimony here today and welcome, Governor. Thanks Thank very you much. very much. Uh, Governor Voinovich, let me say it's the policy of the committee that all witnesses must be sworn before they testify. So if you just ri uh, rise with me and raise your right hand, you solemnly swear the testimony that you will give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. And it's an honor to have you here, and your reputation uh, precedes you uh, both as uh, Mayor of Cleveland and as Governor of Ohio. And welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. And, and Steve, thanks very much for your various, uh, very nice introduction. And I must tell you, Mr. Chairman, it's a real pleasure to know that the district right next to mine in the city of Cleveland is represented by Steve LaTourette. Uh, first of all, let me begin by commending all of you for undertaking the critical challenge of rescuing the District of Columbia from the Straits of Insolvency and Disarray. Uh, I have always felt, and I am certain that most Americans would agree, that the district should be a model for our nation, our shining city on a hill. Sadly, uh, Washington, D.C. is today the opposite of that image, just as Cleveland was in 1979. But the story of the Cleveland comeback proves that your challenges are not unsurmountable. And here's a short version of how my hometown bounced back. From almost any vantage point in Greater Cleveland, the thing that probably stands out most is the physical architecture of the city, particularly the new downtown skyline. Of far more importance, however, is the civic architecture we erected in the early 80s to rebuild not just our neighborhoods in downtown, but our very soul and our self-image. The bedrock upon which we constructed that civic architecture was the public-private partnership urban pioneers rebuilding a city where Cleveland used to be. I would respectfully suggest that first and probably the most important task of this subcommittee is identifying the elements of the local civic architecture that must guide the rebirth of Washington, D.C. When I agreed to leave my post as Lieutenant Governor of Ohio and return to Cleveland in 1979 to run for mayor, I made it clear to the business and civic leaders my conviction that government was only th one thread in the fabric of our community and that to turn Cleveland around, we were going to have to work together and put aside all of our differences, understand we had a symbiotic relationship, galvanize our resources to solve our problems, meet our challenges, and to seize our opportunities. And it worked. Cleveland became the only city to win three All-America City Awards within a five-year period, and not because of the mayor, but because of the public-private partnership that was established of uniquely involving the private sector in the governance of the city of Cleveland and solving the problems that confronted it. A key player was the Financial Supervisory Commission. Uh, I recall convincing the Ohio legislature that the Commission's membership should include stakeholders and not be completely controlled by the State. The Commission developed a financial recovery plan and established the criteria that had to be met in order to, um, to, to terminate it. And that uh, is laid out in the statute. Certain things had to be done in order for the Commission to go away. Uh, I chose to keep the Commission intact as long as I could. One of the things that the legislation provided for us was that uh, we could borrow money to repay the misspent bond funds. I decided that um, we would earmark money from the city income tax and pay it off over a period of years rather than borrowing money to repay money that we'd already borrowed on. We saved the city $24 million in interest by taking the long route instead of doing it easy. Now, it took us seven years. In fact, we had a big burning of the, of the, of the uh, notes uh, celebration. But it kept the Financial Supervisory Commission also there. And um, I, I referred to it as the, as the rudder I needed when we went through uh, stormy uh, weather. 
I think it is imperative that the Mayor fully cooperate with the uh, advisory board. Uh, I think it is also important to recognize that a positive working relationship with the City Council was crucial to our moving uh, our collective agenda forward. Uh, we put the City first. Uh, and one of the things that uh, the legislation provided is that any new legislation that was passed that dealt with money spending in any way had to have the approval of the Financial Supervisory Commission. So we got to a point where Council got a little jittery on some stuff and weren't maybe doing what they were doing. I always said to them, hey, we can't do it, not, not, not in, uh, in, in accord with the plan, can't put the stamp on it, can't put the stamp on it, legislation uh, is, is, uh, is, not, is null and void. So um, the, the advisory commission was, um, was extremely important. Let me briefly touch on, on the actual public par partnerships we put in place in Cleveland. Uh, and I'm saying to you today that if you're just going to put in a, a financial recovery group or commission and, and you think that's it, forget it because you'll do it, it will be around for a while, and then it will go away and things will go back to uh, they were, uh, the way they were before. Uh, let me just tell you some other things I think you need to do. First of all, uh, in addition uh, to having a, a volunteer management audit of the books of the City, which were inauditable, I thought we were $55 million in the hole when I took over. We were actually $110 million in debt. Um, we created an Operations Improvement Task Force, which was an all-volunteer organization of 89 full-time Cleveland executives loaned by 62 companies to determine how city services could be provided in a more efficient, economical manner. Uh, the task force was funded by two of Cleveland's major foundations, the Gund and Cleveland Foundation. They came up with 250, and we raised 500,000 from the private sector. So there was some money there that would back up the task force. Uh, they made 650 recommendations. We implemented 75 percent of them. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It works. I did that as governor. We did the same thing when I became governor of the State of Ohio, got the private sector involved, went through the whole operation, and we have saved millions and millions of dollars because of, of those recommendations. The next thing we did, and I'm not sure if this is as important here as it was in Cleveland, we formed the Cleveland Roundtable. That was our urban coalition. And that roundtable addressed the issues of housing, employment, minority business development, police community relations, racism, and education in the community. And it empowered a lot of people who were out in the city and brought them to the table, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, uh, Appalachian whites were sitting at the table with the bishop and the religious leaders and the bankers and the industrialists. All of it, it was like a little United Nations, a bunch of people sitting at the table who had different clout but had a voice that could be heard. And it was really important to, uh, to moving us forward. And we did one other thing. We created Cleveland Tomorrow to lend their expertise to addressing our long-term economic challenges. This group commissioned two studies to identify critical baseline data, and then proceeded with a three-part strategy to bolster economic development, focus city resources on job creation, and rebuild the central city and Cleveland's neighborhoods. And today, Cleveland Tomorrow is still regarded as the number one public-private partnership in the United States of America. Uh, you might also know that Cleveland ranks number one in the private sector's investment in, in, uh, in housing. Very important they get involved. Over the years, other public-private partnerships were created. Build Up Greater Cleveland was a coalition of public and business officials to identify the infrastructure, our old and crumbling infrastructure. How are we going to do something about that problem? Uh, the story of Cleveland's comeback is much more involved than I could possibly impart in these few minutes. Uh, I'm going to leave some information uh, for you. I want you to know that if this uh, commission is interested in uh, coming to Ohio and to Cleveland. I'll be glad to facilitate that for you um, and be more than happy to uh, uh, bring to this table if you'd like some other people that I think can, can add um, uh, an insight into to what we did. Uh, a man who, um, and I'll finish on this note, who I literally 
uh, conned into becoming the finance director of the city of Cleveland was a man named Bill Reedy. He was with Coopers and Librand. I tried to find a finance director and I couldn't find one. Nobody wanted it. We had a national search and <laughs> nobody wanted the job. And, and Bill was the chairman of the committee and I said, Bill, please, <laughs> you know, I need you. So he left Coopers and Librand and went to work for us and he was our our uh, finance director for three years and, and, and helped quarterback the recovery along with uh, uh, Ernst & Young. Uh, Bill is now the managing partner uh, for Coopers & Librand and their government practice, but he has more insight into what happened and all of the intricacies than probably anybody in this country and I think it would be really worth your while to spend some time uh, with, um, with Bill. Thank you very much. Governor, thank you very much. You know, as you go back to the deep, dark days of 1979 and take a look at what's transpired in, uh, in Cleveland uh, since that time uh, with the partnerships that were created and people working together, I guess it's got to give some hope to people in the district right now who all they're hearing is bad news. And you didn't know at that point how it was going to turn out either. I'm sure there's a lot of uncertainty with you. Do you have any comment on that for the citizens of the district that are looking now and some uh, with nothing but bad news ahead of them, it's, it appears, uh, as the debt goes higher and the uh, layoffs are uh, upon us and everything else? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the problems that we have are created by people, and people can solve the problems. And I think that uh, one of the things that, that we were able to do because of g gathering uh, everyone together and understanding that we had a crisis and that uh, if we were going to be successful, that we had to work together, um, I think that, that, that they, had, they understood that unless they intervened and got involved, it was going to get worse. And, and what I'm saying is that there's, there's got to be some people in this town who own property and are stakeholders who have got to say to themselves, either I'm going to get involved or it, it's going to get worse. And uh, I think that's what it's all about. I can tell you something that I can take Del DeWin, who was uh, chairman of the Cleveland Amaro, is now retired uh, chairman CEO of, of, uh, of the Eaton Corporation. Del DeWin will tell you the most important work he ever did was his work with the city of Cleveland as chairman of the Operations Improvement Task Force and the formation of, of our Cleveland Roundtable and, and Cleveland Tomorrow. Uh, I'm not kidding, urban pioneers, you know, they, they made a difference. And there are people right here in this town that are willing to do that. And uh, you have to identify them and get them to step forward and say, this is your town. And, uh, and, and, and if we're going to make it, it's going to have to be an ongoing commitment. It can't be just a little temporary thing, set it up and then go away and, and everything. Because it'll, it'll, it'll go back. I mean, right now, we, the, the one area where, where we, um, we failed in Cleveland for years, I wanted the state to take over the system because the political leadership just in the government leadership in the uh, school system just wasn't there. And now the federal court has said that the superintendent of public instruction has taken over. But one of the things that I know he's going to do is he's going to get the indigenous leadership of the community involved in it. Because once he leaves, and by the way, his name is Ted Sanders. He was head of your uh, Illinois, uh, 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 he was a Department of Education. In fact, he was assistant uh, Department of Education here in Washington under okay. Lamar. Anyhow, he's, the, he's our state superintendent, but, but you've got to get the indigenous leadership and the people involved in this effort. And understand, you're going to be here for a while, and you know, a lot of you want to stay as long as you can, but the fact is you, that business community provides the continuity. It's like I said to you, that business community that we started, it's still there. Those partnerships are still in place, and they realize they've got to continue to participate. The mayor is cooperating with them. The city council doesn't mean that things are perfect. But um, the fact is that without that private sector, uh, Cleveland would never have made it. Was it difficult to get the private sector to buy in? I mean, they wanted to see some things up front before they put their money out. They saw the city really uh, getting worse without their involvement. How difficult was it to get them uh, involved? Well, uh, and, and to be frank with you, I was lieutenant governor of Ohio, and I wasn't going back. Mrs. Voinovich says, you aren't going back. <laughs> so I sat down with him and said, I'll come back and run, but you pay for the campaign and you're going to help me get this thing back on track 
and I'm not going to be like those other mayors that just sit here and have these problems keep slapping them in the face. We're going to do a complete management audit of that operation, and uh, we're going to develop a, a, a real partnership and develop a strategic plan, and you're going to help me get the job done. So I got commitments right straight up front. I said, you're going to raise the money, you're going to provide it, and, 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 and it was, they were there. Now, the crisis that brought them to the table was the default of the city of Cleveland in 1978. And I think that, I don't know whether anybody th thinks this is a crisis or not. If they don't, I think you've got problems. <laughs> if they do think it's a crisis, uh, then I would think there's some good people here that care about um, their fellow citizens and their district and their country. And I think one of the things that you really ought to be concerned about is, is that this town should be the model for everything in finances and management and, and, and uh, human services programs right across the line. This is a place where you ought to be able to take people and, and say, this is the way it should be done in, in your town. And, and I think that's the kind of commitment you all have to make to this thing, that this, we're going to make this the model city in, uh, in, in the country. Right. Well, we can't do it without the city government as well, and it's, uh, we need to form a federal local partnership to help, and I think we're going to be there for them. But your testimony is critical because you've done it, and you've shown that you can bring a city back. I think that gives us a lot of uh, hope. Uh, my last question to you before I, uh, I recognize uh, Ms. Norton is what kind of resistance did you get from city employees and those groups as the cuts came down uh, uh, in, the, in the bureaucracy? Generally, the institutionally, they're, they're the ones that are the most affected because there's a, there's a cleaning of house. Well, let me say that when we put the Financial Supervisory Commission, we had seven members, four uh, voting members, but there were, there were, there were like ex-official members, the mayor, the president of the city council, the director of the Ohio uh, Office of Budget and Management, and the state treasurer. Those were the four, the, the elected. And then we had three uh, citizens that were on the commission that were appointed by me with the approval of council. Jackie Presser was one of them, hmm. my good friend Jackie Presser. Okay. Thank you. And I had him on there because Jackie I uh, was a union leader, and I knew that it was very important to have union leadership involved. The other one was uh, Bob Bly, who was a, the former chairman CEO of one of our banks. And then another was uh, George Grabner, who handed, headed up Lampson and Sessions as one of our real dynamic uh, uh, citizens. And uh, we, we went to the unions, and we talked to them that we had some problems. Uh, we zeroed out. Uh, there was a, uh, we were, you know, this was, this was, these were terrible times. We were in debt, I didn't, you know, uh, the recession was there, unemployment was, <laughs> and I think that maybe out of the 10 years, and by the way, in 10 years, just, just so you let know what happened, we, we had, we ended up with 10 percent less employees. Um, our budget only increased 45 percent in 10 years, and inflation went up about 85 percent. I had to go to the voters and Cleveland, we do have a city income tax, and Ohio cities have it, but you have to get the voters to approve it. We went to them after we did our operations improvement task force. Business community said, hey, they don't have enough money to run this joint, pay the debt, replace the infrastructure, rolling stock, and so forth, so, let's, so we got it. And that, that, that passed with a two-thirds vote of, uh, of the citizens. So um, the fact is that the unions participated. And I'll never forget that before I went to the voters for that first tax increase, I said to the unions, I'm not going to go there unless you agree before the election, in writing, the limit of what you're going to ask for uh, in wage increases, because I don't want the increase in taxes to be soaked up in wages. And the voters are going to want to know that they're not going to be sucked up in wages. And uh, through, with Jackie's help and some enlightened labor, we got them in a room, we talked about it, and we got them to uh, sign up. Thank you very much. I'm going to recognize now our uh, ranking uh, uh, member, Mrs. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mayor Ivanovich, as I, as I look at uh, uh, um, absolutely right, and, and indeed what, what occurs to me, Governor Ivanovich, is uh, that you've seen um, Cleveland from the two most uh, vital posts in the state, uh, having moved from, from mayor uh, and this crisis to become the governor of the state, and, and since there's no such uh, higher office in the District of Columbia, I guess Mayor Barry has to figure that if he does well enough, he'll become president of the United States. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I'd like to um, uh, follow up on some of what you said that, that most interests me. As I recall it, uh, the oversight appeared to be for one year uh, by this uh, commission. Is that correct? No. The Oversight Commission was in place until we met all of the criteria that were established in the legislation. So how, th so how long was that period? Uh, we didn't. The commission ended, started in 19, let's see. Let's see the first com uh, meeting of the commission was at January 24, 1980, and we burned uh, the uh, the bonds in uh, 1987 could have terminated it earlier, but as I said, one of the condition was is that the misspent bond funds were paid back, and so what we did was we we just entered into an arrangement. Uh, in effect, what happened was I was able to get the banks to come forward, take care of it, and the deal was we'd pay them off in seven years. I didn't want to, my investment bankers all wanted me to issue those bonds because you know <laughs> I said. You know, I'm, I'm from an old ethnic family. We pay cash, you know, and I said, I don't like paying interest. <laughs> so we kept it going for, for seven years, and it was great because they were always there. They didn't interfere a lot, but, 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 but I knew, particularly the council members knew that they were there, and it had a way of kind of helping us stay on track and not get off. Well, I indeed, I was interested in your testimony that you tried to keep them in place as long as possible. Uh, what was your thinking? What I was thinking is, is that first of all, uh, we had their expertise that was available to us. Um, the state continued to, 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 to give us a little money for them, not a lot, but a little bit. And I thought I had this great group of experts that are available to me that are kind of I can go to, and, and they were more my partners than overseers, and, and uh, they were there to help me, and, and as I mentioned, they were very important. And when you were putting budgets together and when council would start saying, we got to do this, and I said, wait a second, we can't do that. That's not part of the recovery plan. So it kept us, I, I refer to them as the rudder that we needed when the, when, the, when the weather got bad, that kept us going through those seas. And, and, and the state paid for the board. They paid for it, but it was minimal. We, fr we gave them free office space, and, and it basically it was nickels and dimes. The staff and so forth. Yeah, but let me, wait, let me correct myself. The part of it that they really helped out was, and now that I, and it's been a long time. In fact, I was on the phone yesterday with Bill Reedy, and he faxed me some stuff to really you know, refresh my memory. The state did pay for the accounting firm, the financial supervisory group. That was uh, at that time Ernst and Ernst. This is Ernst and Young. They 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 did pay for that, and that was a benefit because we, we didn't have to pick up their cost from the city. And I know that can be a great cost. Um, I'm very interest, uh, interested in the contrast between your testimony and the testimony of, um, of um, Mayor Giuliani, who preceded you, because I asked him about the regrowth of the government, which confronted him when he came into office. And you have testified <coughs> that uh, the government, in effect, did not grow because the 85 percent inflation rate compared to the 45 percent growth in the budget indicates uh, uh, some enormous discipline somewhere. And well, there was, let me just point out to you one other thing, and I'm glad the members of Congress are here. Uh, I went through the deficit reduction of 85 that passed. The cities and the counties paid the price. I lost not only did I have bad finances in the early 80s, but I lost $79 million of federal money. I lost all the seat of money. I lost half the community development block grant. Revenue sharing went out the window. So I lost the federal money that was available. And, and then we had the financial problem. And as I said, we had to go to the voters and ask them for additional revenue. But in spite of that, our growth is 45 percent in 10 years versus the inflationary rate. So this, these were tough times. You had to replace the loss of those federal funds, though, with local funds. That's right. And uh, part of the reason why that, you know, that was that put the pressure on. Some of that was good. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I, I think pressure is good. I think that government uh, uh, too often doesn't, they don't, have, they don't get the message. I'm going to be talking to AFSCME uh, here at noon. Uh, we, we're the leader in the country in, in uh, uh, quality management of uh, using quality, we call it quality service through partnership. The, the public sector doesn't get it in most places. Businesses in my state 
understand you got to work harder and smarter and do more with less, that you got to bring technology and you got to be more efficient and, and so forth. And so the workforce here has got to understand that it's not business uh, as usual. And that's why having the management audit is part of this thing, to come in and look at what the way things are doing. Uh, the other thing I'd advise is that I'd get involved in quality. You've got some federal agencies that are doing real well in quality and some that aren't. but. But, uh, but you have to involve, you have to empower the people that are making the decisions to get involved and figure out ways that you can, you can do more with less. It's, uh, the public, the private sector demands that today, demands it. And, uh, and, and the workforce has got to understand that, that they're part, they've got to be part of the solution and not uh, the problem. And, and, I, and I say those words in all due respect because I don't know what the situation is in terms of the workforce here. They may be the most efficient in the world. So if they are, God bless. Thank you, Governor Vonovich. Thank you very much. And I'd like to recognize the chairman of our full committee, uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Klinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Governor. It's always a delight to have you uh, here and to uh, uh, give me an opportunity to commend you on, on the marvelous job you did in Cleveland or doing in Ohio. I, it wasn't that long ago. I, I can remember when there were one of the standard gag line was, uh, well, the last one out of Cleveland, please turn out the lights. And I think you, perhaps as much as anybody, uh, made that sort of an obsolete line and uh, no longer operative. Uh, I thought I'd use this opportunity also to report to you uh, as one of the, the, the great country's leaders in the question of unfunded mandates that we are coming close, I believe, and uh, hopefully today we might actually see a, uh, an agreement between the two bodies on that, uh, that issue. And that would lead me to the question, uh, was that, uh, in, in terms of uh, your stewardship in the city of Cleveland, uh, were unfunded mandates uh, imposed uh, by either states or the federal government a part of the problem that uh, you had to deal with? First of all, uh Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank you very much for your leadership on unfunded mandates. Uh, without your work last year and this year, we wouldn't be where we are today. And, thank you. And, uh, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, the interesting thing in those days was the, the money that we were getting that was cut off. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was as the deficit became larger, Congress became more creative in how they were going to fund some of these mandates. And, and as you well know, today that's grown, at least in Ohio, to about 12 and a half cents of every dollar spent for mandates. And if you don't do something about the current mandates that cities have, and, we, and I'm urging you to do that after you get this done, we want to go back and right. your regulatory bill that you passed in the House I think is great. And I've talked to Senator Dole about doing the same thing. And, but, but get back and look at some of this stuff. But as I say, by 98, it'll be 25 percent. The fact is that... Um, that that wasn't a real the problem that it is today for um, uh, for the cities, but uh, and I have no idea of what impact mandates are having on on um, on, on the uh, on the district. It might somebody might be interested to look at that to see um, maybe there's an area where you might let up on some stuff that might make some money available to them. Uh, in fact, one one of the things that that, that really you ought to look at from a big picture point of view is that if we're talking about cutting back, and I know you're going to cut back on programs for state and local governments. We know that's going to happen. But one of the ways that you can help free up some of the resources is first, don't pass more unfunded mandates. And second of all, get rid of some of the stuff that's there that, that, that would free up some of those dollars so that we can deal with some of the, have some more flexibility on the local level. And I think you heard me talk about the, the police officers. I mean, if Columbus didn't have 12.5% of their, their dollar going for mandates, they could take care of their own police officers. What the Dickens is Congress providing police officers for? That's a local government function. So I think that, uh, that, that what needs to be done is to start to sift some of this stuff out and, and see where, uh, you know, indirectly or directly, you can maybe help the situation from, uh, in terms of, 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 of legislation or maybe even some government regs. I think you put your finger on it. I mean, the proliferation of unfunded mandates really is a fairly recent origin. I mean, it really wasn't a, a problem until, uh, you know, more recent years, but it certainly uh, increased exponentially in, in a very short time. Um, Mayor Giuliani talked about, you know, that uh, the way you attract business back in, the way you create, begin to cre recreate a healthy uh, city uh, is uh, one of the ways is you create a, a, a climate in the city, and that has to do with crime. And, and I, I'm sorry I wasn't here to hear your testimony, but was that a problem uh, for you in terms of uh, making the city a, uh, a livable city, or did you, um, how did you deal with the crime problem? Well, I, I think that the, uh, 
to start off with a well-managed city or well-managed state or well-managed county does more to keep businesses and get them to expand and attract them than anything you, you, can, you can put your finger on. They, 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 that's, you start with that. I think in the area of police protection, um, we had an absolute paradigm. We, we went from a situation where I went to a meeting, uh, my first meeting, neighborhood meeting with the chief of police, and we got dumped on like I've never been dumped on in my entire life. The chief was ready to jump up, and I put my hand on his bill hand, and I said, put my hand, I said, we're here to listen, chief. And what we did was we, we went to town, and uh, we developed police community relations committees in all of the districts where we had citizens uh, come in once a month uh, with the district commander, uh, to talk about the problems in the neighborhoods. Uh, we established, uh, we had an auxiliary police in the city, but they'd been neglected, so I punched it up, that up, gave them money, gave them uniforms, uh, eliminated the, the, the uh, uh, adversarial relationship between the regular police department and the, um, and the uh, auxiliary police. Uh, we uh, began uh, a very, very aggressive uh, block watch program uh, to get citizens involved in, in, in policing their own neighborhoods and um, uh, change the management of the Cleveland Police Department and, uh, and, and also the complexion of that department over the years uh, so that it was more reflective of, of the uh, people in the community. And uh, when I left, uh, City council members and neighborhood people were having police officers, and I'd go to these and they'd honor police officers for the good work that they were doing in the community and they'd bring in their families. So I think that, um, again, if, if that's a major problem here, I think, and, and Mayor White's done a fine job of continuing it, uh, uh, we, we put in a police, com a police review board. Everybody said it was terrible, the unions were opposed to it, and um, we had a couple of very, very bad racial incidents, and um, uh, and and it's worked, it's been great, it provides a, a kind of a place where if somebody really feels they're aggrieved and the system isn't working, they can go there. And, and uh, there were a lot of little things that we did, that we put um, into place. And by the way, uh, the Cleveland Roundtable that I mentioned uh, is very much into dealing with the problems of racism in, in the community. And so uh, that's a very important, if, if you don't have good human relationships in a community. I always say that the relationships, human relationships, people getting along together are more important uh, in infra infrastructure than roads and bridges and the rest of it. We forget about that, but that's fundamental to any good community is that people work together, respect each other, and, uh, and, the, and there's communication going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now recognize uh, Mr. Fattah, the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, if you have any questions. Chairman, I don't have any questions at this time. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chairman of the Committee, uh, recognize now Mr. Gutnick from Minnesota. Well, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I won't ask any questions either, but I, I would like to uh, just make a couple of observations. I, I really feel uh, like a pair of uh, brown shoes at a black tie event this morning uh, to have uh, the excellent testimony that we've had. And secondly, I, I want to thank uh, <coughs> the Governor again because uh, as Grandma used to say, the darkest part of night is just before the dawn. And I think that uh, you've given us re reason to believe that uh, there will be a dawning, there will be a new day for the District of Columbia. And that if we do this right, hopefully we won't have to do it, or future Congresses won't have to do this again. So, again, thank you so much for being generous with your time. You've, you've answered the questions that I had already. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Let me uh, just ask Mr. Patai, I think I had one question. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick question, Governor. There's, there's a lot of discussion about block grants, and I want to know whether you think that as we look at the financial situation here in the district, and as that might play out, uh, unfortunately, in other uh, cities around the country that are in delicate financial situations, how do you think state control over block grants versus direct appropriations and entitlements may, may impact? If you just have some general comment on that. I, I can give you some real Specific comment. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the temporary family assistance bill, for example, block grant, uh, I'm in favor of that becoming an entitlement to the state and not to the individuals. Uh, I'm in favor of Congress uh, uh, not prescribing uh, how we spend that. 
that, that Congress give us the flexibility so that we're able to take those dollars and, and use them and, 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 be, and, do, and work harder and smarter and, and, and do more with less and not have to get waivers uh, uh, like we have to do today in order to, 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 to utilize those dollars in the most effective way. Uh, we also uh, insist that uh, if you're going to freeze the money, uh, that, um, that you not just use 94, that you go back and, and you average that amount over a, a, a several years, and that you also put in place a, uh, a rainy day fund that, um, that's available in case uh, some states' uh, economy goes in the dumpers and they, and, and, and they need help. But I think that we have a thing called the Children and Family First Initiative in Ohio. And again, it's a really looked at as one of the best in the country. But the whole effort there is to get human service agencies to work together and, and cut through the red tape so that they can provide services uh, to, the, to their customers. And one of the frustrating things is that, that these categorical programs uh, make it more difficult. For example, Head Start and, and daycare. Uh, we lead the nation in Head Start. Ohio's 100 percent ahead of, of, the, of the national average. We have 70 percent of our kids in the Head Start program uh, and all and, and of, of our eligible kids in the program. Spend more money on Head Start, by the way, than any state does. Uh, but if you want to put Head Starts, I want to put them in the, into daycare facilities. Well, the Head Start money can't be used for daycare. Daycare can't be used for Head Start. If you could take some of these programs and meld them, I think you can get a much bigger bang for the buck than you're getting right now. And do a better job of taking care of our customers. Governor, let me just try to follow up. And I know it, 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 it's not the case in your great state of Ohio. Uh, I come from Pennsylvania, and we've had a... Uh, you got a new great governor, by yeah, the way. We, we've had uh, over the, uh, uh, the past couple of decades, and it's been reported in the literature, uh, perhaps to exist in other places around the country, uh, something of an anti-big city bias in state legislatures uh, as part of the kind of normal political discourse that sometimes takes place. And whether or not you think cities big cities would fare better under these block grant approaches given that that notion or whether you think that that notion is not really a relevant factor I, around I, the country as we if, if look at urban urban issues yeah. if you're talking about our customers okay our, the, the the counties in ohio run the human service program mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the money comes through the state but in effect they are what are the ones that administer the program and this is where we've established our children and family first initiatives um, i really believe that if we could blend this money uh, and look at where the needs are and have the flexibility that we'd like to have that uh, we can do a better job of taking care of our, our children and families um, than we're now doing today. And I mean that sincerely. It's got nothing to do. I mean, I, I just think that we can take your money and spend it better than <laughs> what is being spent today if we have the flexibility. But I don't want, uh, you know, who's eligible, how long, and all. Let us worry about it. And, uh, you know, we're the laboratories of democracy. And uh, if uh, I'll just, you know, if there's a good program out there, y you want competition. I'll try to steal a program that Tommy Thompson has in Wisconsin, or uh, we just, we just, my wife kicked off our Help Me Grow program. We've got 600,000 from the private sector, and the state's putting 700,000 into a, a major program to reduce infant mortality. That program got started in South Carolina. We thought it was so good that, uh, that we're copying it. And so, what you need is innovation out there. And I think that uh, some of the stuff will work, some of it won't. But the fact of the matter is, is that the system that we have right now is not working. It's broken. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> thank, you thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lotteret, gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I promised the governor I'd get him on his way by noon. And since I've had the opportunity to see his handiwork up close, uh, I, I'll uh, 
yield so Mr. Flanagan can quench his thirst. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Governor, for taking the time to, to accept our invitation today. If you could work one more miracle, uh, that would be to get the Indians back on Jacob's Field come April. I would appreciate that very much. And, uh, and just to the gentlelady from the district, I, I'm very comfortable with the Governor leading the uh, the state of Ohio, the observation that we have no interim step between mayor and president of the United States may have been the, one of the better arguments for statehood I've heard, I've heard in a while. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Let me take uh, Mr. Flanagan, any questions? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Latourette, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Latourette's very kind to me. He knows how windy I can be, so I'll, I'll save it to just one question, Governor. Uh, we heard uh, uh, earlier in your testimony uh, a very interesting uh, use of the the advisory board in, in, in a firewall, a political firewall with the, with the city council that might not want to do uh, the recommendation and, and a strong leader standing up saying, no, no, this is the plan and we've got to stick to the plan. Uh, uh, that, I think, would certainly have uh, efficacy here, depending on the shape, size and flavor of the board that, that we may use here. Uh, I was also very interested to hear about the Cleveland Roundtable, and I was wondering, uh, over and above its advisory capacity and a sounding board for economic and social issues, does it have any formal function uh, over and above that, and does it complement the, the, the uh, financial advisory board in any way? No, it had no connection whatsoever with the financial advisory board, but it did give the people who live in the neighborhoods uh, instantaneous empowerment where they felt they were shut out of the system. And uh, it was through the roundtable uh, uh, they've got a very, very aggressive program in, in improving race relationships uh, in, in the city of Cleveland. Uh, a little offshoot of it was really kind of interesting is that in the area of jobs, uh, we had a lousy labor management uh, reputation. And through that group, we created an e a thing called Work in Northeastern Ohio, where we got uh, middle echelon labor and business leaders uh, into school talking about uh, communication and quality, and that helped the, uh, the uh, uh, today I think if you talk to business, they'd say it's got, you know, Cleveland, Greater Cleveland has a good uh, business uh, uh, labor uh, environment. And uh, let's see what else, uh, got involved in, in our housing programs uh, and working uh, with our Cleveland Tomorrow group to get them to start to invest in housing in the neighborhoods. In fact, Cleveland Tomorrow, um, uh, provides money to neighborhood organizations uh, for the expertise they need to um, take advantage of the various programs that are out there to uh, to, to do housing. And it's another thing, if you come to Cleveland today, Mayor, Mayor White's done a fabulous job. I think there's probably more new housing in Cleveland today than probably any other city in the country uh, because of these partnerships that um, that have been uh, been set up so that uh, the round table is not just a chowder society it's a group of people that come together and if there's a problem and it's it's a um, it also deals well, I, here's a real good example we had a big racial problem at Cleveland State University and uh, they just couldn't resolve it at the university and the round table stepped in and provided the leadership and and, and the table where people could come together to to uh, to, to resolve that um, uh, that problem so that um, it's uh, it's, a, it's just a outstanding institution to uh, to have in place. It helped us, encourage our, our work with our police uh, community relations committees, um, and um, very, very helpful. It, it sounds like, uh, although lacking a formal function, it, it sounds relatively indispensable to the overall plan for uh, the, the future of Cleveland uh, as it was seen then and, and as it is now. Uh, and that's, uh, that's indeed encouraging, being that uh, government doesn't always have to take an, an active hand, but uh, in, in an advisory level uh, for financial, economic, or, or social reasons, so uh, the community can come together and, and provide leadership uh, uh, and, on levels such as these, which turn out to be indispensable. Uh, I thank you, Governor, and I thank you, Chairman. Okay. I yield back. Okay. Uh, Governor Bornovich, thank you very much for your willingness to appear today on such short notice. and. I know that Mr. Latourette was instrumental in contacting me. He deserves this committee's thanks. And today he's an outstanding uh, product of Ohio, doing a great job here for us. We appreciate having him here and, and on this subcommittee. I think your story should inspire the people and the government of the District of Columbia rather than frighten them. 
I'd also point out to anyone who fears the presence of such a board in the district that you were so wounded by your services, Mayor, that you went on to be a governor and voted uh, almost by acclamation last November. So uh, uh, we, we wish you well in your future endeavors, but thank you very much for your testimony today. And it really has enlightened us as we move through a very, very uh, uh, tough next few weeks in, in working through this legislation. So well, thanks. I'm glad to be here, and, I, and I'm genuine when I say if somebody on a committee wants to get in touch with me and plug in with some folks that, that know a lot more about this in terms of the details, we'll I would be more than happy to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It would be very interesting being in touch with the governor with respect to that business roundtable and, and the, uh, what appears to be a, a, an extraordinary contribution that they made to the city's recovery. Thank you. We've got the names and we'll be in, this can be able to be in contact with them. Thank you very much. I, I might just mention to you that uh, your good friend Carol Hoover, Carol was the genesis. She's the one. We went to Detroit. It's really, in, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, uh, Carol Hoover is uh, one of our great leaders. In fact, she's now president of the Greater Cleveland uh, Growth Association, which is our Chamber of Commerce. But Carol had encouraged me to create that Urban Roundtable. And we went to Detroit to copy what they were doing in Detroit. And the irony of it is, is that I guess three years ago, Detroit invited them back to Detroit to tell them how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> so Carol, Carol really has the uh, and, and knows what how that works. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Right, for our next panel, we've got a truly distinguished panel to discuss the original New York crisis and how it was dealt with. Um, first of all, we have uh, former Governor Hugh Carey, is a seven-term member of the uh, House of Representatives, who's born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, graduated from St. John's University and St. John's University uh, Law School. Uh, as a, uh, represented the old 12th Congressional District in Brooklyn for uh, seven terms before he was uh, elected the 51st Governor of New York on November 5, 1974. And as Governor, he was the architect of the financial plan that averted the bankruptcy of New York City and began a sweeping program of fiscal reform and economic development to restore uh, the state's vitality. His extensive tax reduction program in excess of $2.5 billion was the keystone of restoring New York's competitive economy in the 1970s. He instituted the I Love New York program and founded the Empire State Games. Nationally, he was a spokesman for regional concerns and a proponent of comprehensive programs uh, for urban and industrial revitalization. And he founded the Conference of Northeast Governors. Uh, in 1991, Mr. Kerry was chosen by his fellow governors as the first chairman of the National Institute of Former Governors and was reelected as chairman uh, through 1994. Uh, he is a director of Meditrust, Inc., First Albany Corporation, of the China Trust Bank and Triart Companies, and is currently uh, uh, with the W.R. Grayson Company in their Government Relations Division. And we also have Ned Regan, who is the former, uh, is a po currently a policy advisor to the Jerome uh, Levy Economic Institute, but was, and is a member of numerous corporate and foundation boards, but he was the New York State Controller from 1979 to 1993, uh, engaged in uh, governmental financial management systems and pension system investments. Uh, Mr. Regan is a frequent lecturer and author on national and regional economic trends and infrastructure investment and governance processes of U.S. corporations. Um, it, it is uh, our, the policy of the committee to swear in witnesses. Uh, Governor Kerry, you're exempt from that if you'd like, or you do it as a former member, but I'd like to get Mr. Regan get you Let's up. Play safe. Hey. <laughs> uh, after me, um, you promised to uh, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. Be seated. Governor Kerry, you'd like to proceed? And let me just say uh, how thrilled we are to have you here. And with the experience that you uh, uh, bring to this committee, we're, we're honored to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I'm delighted to be here to sort of celebrate an anniversary. I'm very conscious of anniversaries in my advanced age, but today I'm sort of celebrating a dual anniversary. Maybe 30 years ago, uh, I was. Uh, uh, encouraged to cross the Remagen Bridge, and I was comforted because there were so many brave men ahead of me. And uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, comforted because I decided to cross the Rubicon and go from Albany to save New York City, uh, either Rubicon or the Hudson Harlem River. I don't know which it was, but uh, I was encouraged because so many brave men and women followed me. And they on began kind of an odyssey in terms of getting to know what a control board is. So maybe I can best address that metaphorically. A control board is not a hair shirt, it's not penitential, it's not a straitjacket or a restraining sheet to prevent the governance of the people involved. A control board is somewhere between slim fast and weight watchers. 
It's a, budget, it's a budgetary regimen to produce fitness over a designated period. To really stretch the metaphor, it's best compared to Dr. Warner's corset, which became eventually the two-way stretch girdle and is now Victoria's Secret. In a word, wear it, you'll like it. I've provided the committee with a chronology, a compendium, of all the steps. It's a rather deep document. It's very weighty. It goes through all of the procedures we had to undertake to involve ourselves in a control board, and I've entrusted it to your staff for research and resources, and we'd be glad to help in terms of working with them on that at any time. I trust that the circumstance which led to New York City's condition in the 70s are rather well known to the committee. New York had an immediate cash flow shortage of over $750 million, a budget gap of over $3.6 billion. Credit markets were closed to the state, and the city condition threatened to affect the credit of the state, which was being safeguarded by the then controller and worried even that office. So joblessness was a major problem in the 70s and very severe in big cities like New York and indeed Washington. But there's one job nobody wanted, and that is to be the person responsible for the rescue plan for New York City. As a result, as a governor with some discretion, I, I decided that the best way to do it was not to do it alone. And as Mayor Giuliani has said, Governor Voinovich, the best deal is to bring together a coalition, the private sector, labor organizations, nonprofits, and volunteers, and do it together. In other words, in our days of hardship, we formed that kind of partnership or coalition that was really modeled on the wartime experience of Harry Truman. My history tells me that when we faced the peacetime conversion in Harry Truman's sermon office, he didn't do it alone. He reached out, grappling with the problems of lack of resources and wartime economy, needed to shift gears to a peacetime, and shall we say, a worldwide leadership role. He did it with the dollar a year men. Harry's dollar a year men came to Washington, stayed long enough to get the job done, and went their way. That's the way we did it in New York City as well, using the Truman model. It was bipartisan. It needs to be bipartisan. For instance, the governor was chairman, but the mayor of the city was on the board. The control of the state, the control of the city, members from the private sector, members from labor, a professional staff headed by an executive director. Now, how did the board conduct itself? As chairman for eight years, I can recount. The sessions were friendly, forthright, often turbulent, frequently humorous, but constructive. In eight years of dealing with several budgets toward recovery, we achieved consensus and never heard one dissenting vote when it counted. Where did the board come from in 1975? Well, President Gerald Ford, the White House, and Treasury Secretary Republicans. One part the Democratic governor, two parts state legislature, one Republican, one House Democratic. For the benefit of the record, let me refer to the involvement of President Ford and his staff in 1975. Contrary to misleading reports, President Ford never told New York to, quote, drop dead. Rather, he and I agreed <clears throat> we had to have a plan that would work so the city and state would not become chronic invalids depending on federal support. Strengthen the unit of government, work it out, and then back away and let it work out its own future re re resolution uh, with a reinforced kind of structure. We worked out a seasonal loan plan under the guidance of Bill Seidman advisor to the White House, same Bill Seidman, who then had lately headed up the FDIC, which is an outstanding performance record. The implementation of the SLA, SLA that's a student loan, or rather the seasonal loan agreement, was headed by Secretary of the Treasury, Bill Simon, whom we often refer to as Simon Legree. Bill was tough, but very fair. Time would not permit me now to note all the other federal officials involved, but in the next administration under President Carter, Roger Altman, as Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, became our mentor, and he was most effective and helpful in those difficult years. Yes, President Ford helped us again in securing passage of the required legislation in Congress with only one onerous stricture. President Ford looked me in the eye and insisted that all documents involved in the loan agreement would provide that my personal guarantee would be on those documents and my signature. So at one time, I was a guarantor for $3.6 billion with interest. Two comments. One, we paid the principal interest in six years, and during that time, at least on paper, my signature... <laughs> on working on the structure of the control board, I, can, I have given the committee a compendium. All of the operations involved including the founding as well of 
what became a rather famous organization, the Municipal, Municipal Assistance Corporation, known as Big Mac. Some of these were, of course, control organizations, and some were funding. And my good friend, the controller, is most familiar with the conduct of that because he, again, was a watchdog on some of these agencies. We have a hero's list, we have a heroine's list of people that came forward and served on that board. The private sector was heavily involved, private sector in labor, private sector in management. And I can go into those names, but candidly, everyone in New York with those names has gone forth to the private sector, and I can encourage you, when you go to the private sector, they're all in the six and seven figure uh, earnings capacity now. It didn't hurt them. They learned a lot, and they went forth to make their fortunes. I have even spoken to the longest serving member of that board, Mr. Stan Schumann, who's still on the board after these 20 years, and he has agreed if you want him to come as an expert and tell you what it's like to serve on a board for 20 years. I don't expect this board will last that long. I hope not. Indeed, we're planning a reunion of our group in, in April. And in the course of our discussions, they've all agreed that if you want them to help, they'll be here to do it. They do not mind coming to the District of Columbia. They have other reasons to be here. And that's the kind of support that I'd like to see this committee get. Let me state what I think is a proper metaphor for a control board. And I look to the cerebral. Uh, cerebral regions to, to come up with this metaphor. I think it should be looked upon as a guardian angel. Critics may some look upon the control board as an intrusion on home rule and may suggest the guardian angel is more like Lucifer. But I see the board as more resembling the archangel Michael with his sword in his scabbard ready to smite waste and efficiency and to safeguard the security of the residents and save the children and needy from hardship caused by lack of resources and scarce resources at this time. That's the job of the control board. In no case, in no case in 20 years in New York has any mayor ever raised a complaint or charge of intrusion on the conduct of the city. In fact, as I heard Mayor Giuliani, he said he only wished that his predecessors had used the board more or to access to the board to safeguard the financial plan from those excesses that began to creep into the plan because times were rather good and payrolls began to edge upward. And if the control board had taken a closer look, perhaps New York would not have had the difficulty that Mayor Giuliani faced. So the control board is a good watchdog, a good guardian. It does not, it does not come forcing its way into City Hall, but it's there to help. And the principal feature of that board is this. I don't know how any mayor, I don't know how Mayor Barry or any mayor could in today's complex situation evolve a city budget in one year or for one year ahead. The beauty of a control board is that it sets up a financial plan. And in that board plan, not one year, but in 1975, in September, the Financial Control Board with the Municipal Assistance Corporation laid out a plan of financing for the City of New York through 1978, actually a four-year plan. When that plan is there, this is what happens. The mayor can see the resources he's going to get three, four years ahead and can therefore plan more effectively for the use of those resources. In addition, the mentor agency, whoever it may be, in this case, the executive branch, once put, he puts those resources in the financial plan, once that agency puts a resource in the financial plan, they must be delivered. You can't cut back. So it's a dual obligation, one, to perform proper planning, the other one, for the rendering agency, whoever it may be, on the advice of this committee, to bind the funding agency to put in the resources so you can plan ahead properly. I think there's one of that forward planning as I see it right now. As I heard the mayor more recently, he's talking about trying to close his $700 million more budget gap by this October, and then he's looking forward to what he calls the miracle budget year away. I would encourage this committee to guide the mayor past the miracle budget to a budget that we can count on three or four years ahead. Why? If we're going to ask the private sector, as we did in New York City, to come in, you can't do what laboratory technicians won't do, scientists won't do. You need lead time. You need to plan these resources so if this is going to be the city on the hill, if this is going to be the capital of which we're proud, we can say we have taken care of this problem now, and now we can go about the business of bringing industry in, bringing initiatives in. What helped New York? The I Love New York program. It grew tourism from $2 billion to $7 billion because we had something to offer. Not dirty streets and empty buildings. We had great theaters. We had the opera. We began, I remember, being in Germany. And the Germans said, your city's in great trouble. Your opera's on strike. I said, we have three opera companies. Only one's on strike. They didn't know that. We've got to tell the world what we, this is the world's leading city for the example of a good government. We've got to show that. I dare to say in time that this city can rival 
in a small way, the benefits of New York City, in a small way. <laughs> I would quote our late president, John F. Kennedy. He said, the District of Columbia is a wonderful combination of northern charm and southern efficiency. Now, I believe President Kennedy. I think that can happen. I really think you have an opportunity here. The urgency, as I see it, is though the mayor is grappling with a budget and a gap by October. You need a longer process than that. The control board, properly comprised, will have private sector people. Some of the labored leaders he's dealing with should be sitting on that board. The confluence of interest comes forth on the board. The leadership can be provided by somebody. I, I don't know how it's going to work, because none of you, thank God, are eligible. You can't serve on the board. But you can certainly find in this government of ours, at a time when we're talking about restructuring, downsizing, making government more efficient, a model for the District of Columbia. I think it's a great opportunity for the committee. I stand ready to help in any way I can. And as I said 30 years ago, I got involved in crossing a bridge. Thank God brave people are ahead of me. I'm glad you're ahead of me now. I'll follow your lead. Thank you. Thanks. Governor, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Regan, I apologize for putting you after Governor Kerry. That's a tough act to uh, follow. No, that's uh, happened to me on many, many occasions. Uh, <laughs> but I, I was always his but auditor. But by papers. I, I was his auditor, so it worked. <laughs> Would you have me? Uh, Please oh, go Mr. Ahead. Chairman, uh, thank you very much, and and uh, and Governor Kerry, I have uh, distributed to you uh, and your members a uh, a statement which is which I um, I'm not going to read. It is really a history of the financial oversight process in New York City. It's the first one, strangely enough, we discovered. It's the first one that has ever been done. Uh, you referred, uh, uh, in other than Charles Morris's book, which you just referred to, and perhaps the governor's uh, testimony, uh, which you just listened to. Uh, but we, myself and staff assistants, we did this in the transition period of Governor Pataki. Uh, myself and staff uh, interviewed 42 people, uh, including Governor Kerry and Mayor Koch and um, everybody that was uh, involved in this process. Uh, reviewed every document, uh, we have them all, every budget document, all of the legislation, uh, the whole history we now have, and then I summarized it in that uh, five or six page report as to how New York City's oversight process got formed and what uh, the process should be uh, going forward. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Many of the questions that were asked are covered in that five or six, uh, are answered really in that five or six pages. Just two points. Um, why a control board uh, process? Why an oversight process? Well, the first is that what you're really going to do is bond out. I don't care how you call it, you're going to take the present deficit, the structural deficit, the accumulated problems, and you're going to borrow, or the city is going to borrow. And that means, as, as it did in New York State, as it did in, in New York City, as it did in Cleveland, as it did in Bridgeport, and any place else where this has been done, that future generations are going to have to pay the principal and interest and are going to have to pay for the problems uh, created uh, by others who came before them. And if you're going to ask future generations to pay 5, 10, 15, and 20 years now, you've got to guarantee them that this will not occur again. And you've got to guarantee them that there's this cure is permanent. That is the trade-off you make with the people that have to pay the debt service in the coming, uh, in the coming uh, 10 to 20 years. Kind of a second reason, it seems to me, you do an oversight process is that goes, it, it reflects about how government really works. And uh, I've spent 27 years in government, so I have some feel uh, for it. Um, you. Uh, there is action in government when uh, everybody's backs are uh, to the wall. That's when, you, that's when action occurs. Well, an oversight process or a control board has the effect of moving the wall up to their backs. Then things can happen. 
That's the democratic process. That's just the way it works. You force people to do things that are very difficult to do without either the wall at their backs or their back to the wall. And of course, you create an environment among the electorate, uh, among the constituents, the stakeholders, the unions, the citizens. Uh, you create an environment uh, that change is absolutely needed and change is required. So the fact that you have pretty much, as I understand it, Mr. Chairman, and your other colleagues resolved the idea that you're going to move ahead with an oversight process uh, is commendable. And, uh, and now it seems to me it's how does it now work, which is my final point. In New York State, there were three agencies. And we've only mentioned one here, though the governor uh, now and then looked over as he, of course, had a habit of doing, wondering what his auditor was going to say next. Uh, and that, uh, uh, because the auditor, an independent auditing agency, uh, while not as important as a control board, which I'll touch on in a minute, um, is a vital, vital, vital part of the process. And absolutely, I don't know how you do this in in this great city without having, and I would go so far as to say, an independently elect elected auditor. How, whether you call it aud auditor general, whether you call it controller, or, what not, or, or how, whatever the label is. That's one of the agencies that seems to me it worked well in New York and you would want it here. Actually, I took over the office of controller uh, from uh, Arthur Levitt Sr., who had established uh, the parameters of this office. And for years to come, following both when Mr. Levitt was the controller and then myself, um, we were known as the once true source of accurate numbers. While there would be shouting and yelling, this, this person, that person, this set of numbers, people could always come to, and here is the Important fact, the independently elected controller who was accountable to the people so that there was power there to bounce that person out, either Mr. Levitt or myself, if the governor said and could prove those numbers are wrong, or the mayor. Oh, the credibility and authority that went with that office because it was elected uh, I think was an enormous help in the control board, uh, the whole oversight process. So that's agency, that's one of the agencies. The second Governor Carey just referred to, and that was a separate agency to do the borrowing. Because the, cre the markets are the ultimate discipline here. They really are, <laughs> as we all know. Uh, and the rating agencies are going to in many ways, call the tune. And you, it's terribly important to have an independent group who's got, who have, whose only function is to access the markets, to borrow, and who develops credibility with the markets, with the rating agencies, separate from the control board and separate from the auditing agency. Again, Governor Kerry established and just referred to uh, the Municipal Assistance Corporation, MAC, who performed that duty and still, and still is there to perform it if need be. The third and most important agency is the control board itself. But notice the significant uh, impact and uh, importance of the other two. And the control board itself has to be, and I um, uh, back up what the governor has said after all of our interviews and all of our work with the uh, people of, that have been involved in the last 20 years in, in New York City and New York State um, has to be composed of everybody that's a player, and that includes the mayor. Uh, I do not see, in spite of the strong differences, which have already been alluded to, uh, the strong differences between the city of Washington and the s other cities. I just do not see how you leave the mayor out of the process. The compromising, the working it out has to go on in, pr 
prior to the control board meetings or at the meetings. And the mayor must be the mayor's constituents and the mayor must and the mayor himself or herself must feel part, it seems to me, again, the history of New York City, uh, must feel part of this uh, uh, process. And it's the control board that, of course, imposes uh, strictures or eases up uh, and functions because they've got the important people on. And like any democratic process, like your own committee caucus meetings, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that's where a lot of things are worked out. And that's how the control board, as you heard the governor uh, um, uh, allude to and refer to, that's how the thing worked out in New York, uh, in New York City. But one final point. The chairman of the control board, or, and let, I'll use that, you, you might end up calling it something different or you might have a different person. But at the top of this process has got to be somebody who will exercise leadership when it's called for. They don't have to bark and yell every time a new budget comes out. But when a crisis starts to develop, there's got to be somebody at the top that has developed influence, that has a constituency, that has created in this environment who, when he or she speaks, is able to move the process. Without that leader, and I'll, let's say that a chairman of the control board, and go, which Governor Kerry was, without a leader like that, then you get, then you run into problems, and the control board, as you heard Mayor Giuliani refer to, uh, could slip into becoming just another part of the political process. So. We can establish all the great agencies we want, and they can be the best constructed, and you've certainly heard uh, from, uh, from New York City and Cleveland and the state of Ohio and the state of New York, you've certainly probably had the best advice you could possibly get with the three individuals that preceded me, uh, the best advice you could get in the country uh, as to how to structure things and how to set it up. But without somebody at the top who understands both the numbers and understands the public and understands how to exercise public policy in a political environment, uh, without that, uh, you will continue to bump into difficulty. And that's my testimony. Mr. Regan, thank you, Mr. Regan, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go down to questions, and I'll start by, first of all, thanking you very much, uh, bo both of you, for coming here. And I, I think, once again, you give a lot of encouragement to the process, that this is a process that may look very dark right now, but New York came out of it uh, uh, very well, and uh, you probably got some liaison and some uh, cooperation between groups that had never been there before, before this crisis. Uh, Governor, let me ask you, uh, you had a very, you had probably the most varied control board of all of the ones we have looked at because you had a wide representation on it. Uh, when the final decisions were made, were they often split decisions? Were they four to three? Did they come down along any lines? Would you care to share any? Uh, now, as controller, as controller uh, uh, Regan said, there is a consensus that develops, and I could go down a list of tough decisions, a ceiling on the city budget, a moratorium on additional taxes, dismissals of thousands of municipal workers, elimination of positions, a city budget and freeze on new hiring, a suspension of wage increases, an increase in the transit fare, the imposition of tuition at the city university for the first time in the history of the city and state, significant reduction in the capital budget, appointment of a special mayoral, mayoral deputy for finance, a professional came in to help the mayor. Big, tough decisions for everybody. Every one of those passed without a dissenting vote because, as the controller said, you thrash these things out in a political atmosphere, but you look at the future of the body which you're trying to govern. You say, for the long pull, we've got to take care of this city. We've got to take care of the District of Columbia. And I suggest to you, it's a very, it's a very, uh, as I say, trying process. But as Mayor, uh, as Governor Vanovich said, and as Mayor Giuliani says, you're surrounded by a private sector that wants to help you. Come in and help that decision process. It's extremely important to bring in those business heads. And I mentioned them in passing over the course of years. Every one of those was helpful in urging the right decision on the people in the political system. So the political system works better 
when you have this consensus, and it can be achieved. Even though, as I said, we had Democrats, Republicans, we had labor leaders sitting there, and the labor leaders will challenge the business people to come up with the right answers. It's a very good thrashing process in which the truth comes forth, and the truth is what governs the process. The benefit to the city is the local unit of government. It gets the resource it needs, and they're pledged, and they're delivered. That isn't the way it is now. Year to year, I don't think the district knows what its emolument's going to be, and never did. And that's one of the most difficult things, is to run a railroad where you don't know where the coal is coming from the next stop. Great. Um, let me, I'm just, uh, Governor Kerry has given over a number of his public papers and addresses on this issue that will be included in the record. Thank and you. I very much appreciate you doing that, because I think from both of you giving giving us some of the substance behind these decisions over the years is going to add uh, to our record as we draft this legislation and move it through the Congress. Um, I just want to quote, I was just thumbing through this, uh, having received it this morning, uh, but from some testimony that the, the governor gave back in 1975 where you talk about New York City was the city with the strongest municipal unions uh, in the nation. The toughest. But you had a wage freeze which I think had been unheard and of. Give backs, and give-backs. And, and give-backs. And then the union invested their pension funds in the various securities which we offer them. With the largest construction industry in the nation in the city, you put a freeze on new capital construction. Uh, in the financial capital of the world, uh, you couldn't borrow money <laughs> without going through this. The uh, city couldn't borrow money. So it shows a tough time sometimes bring some strange people together uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the good. But, I think as we look back, we'd have to say this was really one of the successes uh, in this country, one of the creative uh, successes. On the borrowing, I've noted, I think, some statements by Dr. Norton, a great neighbor of ours in New York City during other heydays, and she pointed out that the benefit of this control board is that over the period of time, it'll reduce the cost of borrowing, and those monies which are earned by the city by a better credit rating and reduced cost of borrowing can go to the benefit of children, of the elderly, the, what's needed in the city. You don't give the money to Wall Street if you have a financial plan which lowers your cost of borrowing, then the money is there for the neighborhoods. Okay. Let me just, if I could, just note the presence in the room, uh, Governor, of your son, Paul, who's with the White House and their legislative liaison. We're happy to have you here. And note, as we draft this legislation, we're trying to get a consensus among some very disparate groups in Congress that ordinarily don't cooperate on issues. But I think we're all trying to work together and, and with the White House on this and with the mayor and council and try to forge this on. But your testimony is very helpful about being more inclusive in the process, making sure everybody's here. And you're telling us that it can all work out. I can only note a moment of history again that it was my return to this body in a very tough election in the year 1962 that my son Paul was born and the birth of him as a seventh son was such a big event in the district he accounted for 280 votes which was my margin. <laughs> well we're glad to have him with us uh, now and have him with us uh, today uh, uh, as well. Um, let me just ask Mr. Regan, um, the um, we hear a lot about individuals expressing concern for the children and the district and so on, but it seems to me the biggest harm is to consider, continue to pile up debt that these no children are going to have to pay for out of programs as they get older. I just didn't wonder, either one of you have comment on that. Well, sure, that's, uh, uh, um, I'll start it because it's only finishing my statement uh, or elaborating on it, um, that, that if you can, the more you let it drift, the higher the debt, there is no magic bullet. There are good solutions. You've heard about them. But the first thing you do is stop the bleeding. <laughs> Very first thing you do. You just cannot let it go on. And this is why you're here, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your staff. You just can't let it go on and force future generations to pay for something that should have been stopped five or ten years back. That's unfair. And that really, and we've talked about elections here, terribly distorts the whole election process. And it distorts what we believe in in a democracy that, that uh, and I run for office, and the governor has, that you distribute services here and you tax for them here, and then you run for office, and you go to the electorate, and they have to equal. But if a situation exists where you contribute, where you can deliver more services here, and tax less there, 
then the democratic process is distorted, and five or ten years from now, somebody faces just the opposite. So, of course, stop it now. Uh, draw the line in the sand, which is why you're here and your committee, and impose the solution, and it'll be easier on everybody. Governor, you balanced eight budgets. Uh, can you comment? Let me suggest something else which I think can happen in the district, which I believe uh, candidly should happen. You've sort of reached the plimsoll line now because your income, personal income tax level in the city is just about 10 percent. That's about where it was in New York City when New York City got in real trouble. So you can't go much further into those pockets without people leaving. That's number one. Number two, when you do this process, something else is going to happen. We're talking block grants, and it's a, it's a, it's a great principle of you know, devolution to get to the spending levels, a more effective way of handling, handling funds, and the governor spoke about that and else. However, something else has to occur. At every level of government, there are burdens which are properly borne by that level of government, and there are those which are beyond that level of government. Two ways you can handle the overburden in a city like Washington. One, you need collaboration and cooperation in the surrounding region. In New York, we have the Regional Plan Association, which looks at the complex of New York State, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, and says, these things you should work on together. I don't know that's happening in the Delmarva Peninsula. I don't see that exchange and collaboration in the surrounding area, even though many of our employees and visitors come from that area and go home without sharing in the burden that perhaps they should. That's one. The second thing is, in terms of the planning, you need, you need, besides the metro plan, other ways in which you plan for the future of this district as a region. And that can come out of this, too. Finally, in terms of burden shifting, when the state was forced to look at the city condition in New York City, and Yonkers, by the way, it was another city that had a control board, we had to say, okay, the time has come. We can't ask the city to pay for the cost of courts, so the state assumed the cost of the courts. The city, city for the first time, gave to the state, and the state accepted, the funding of the city university as part of a statewide system. The city, the state in turn, picked up the deficit of the transit fare. So some burdens will shift from the district. And I hardly encourage this because you better look at what you're making this international city do to handle the raft of visitors coming in, the official parties that come here, and look how much of that might be shifted to the rest of us in the United States because it's our city too. Thank you. I, I, I happen to agree with that, and I know our mayor of the city agrees with that, but it's important for somebody from the outside to come in and lend that perspective. Thank you very much. I'm going to yeah, yield now to Mrs. Uh, uh, Norton, the, uh, the ranking member. Thank you very much, and I very much appreciate this, this testimony, um, Governor Carey and Controller Regan. Uh, Governor Carey, uh, the, the list uh, that you just rattled off of what New York had to do initially uh, is a shocking list. It's a kind of list of horribles. Uh, around uh, Washington already has gone the, the number of people that had to be laid off, the 60,000 number, which is 50 percent more employees than we even have, uh, laid off at one time. I, I'd like to ask you um, uh, whether doing all, all the, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask about the role of the board in that list of horribles, and then I'd like to ask you whether, uh, whether the, it simply meant that New York was that far gone, and the reason I ask you is because we're, we're further gone than New York. Was New York so far gone that it became necessary to do all of these things at once in order to save it or to, to get a, a loan? Uh, and what role did the board play in taking you through this extraordinary uh, uh, list of changes uh, in the city itself when nothing at that point had been transferred to the state and the, and, and the things that were to follow? Well, the timing is exquisite and indeed painful. However, I see the mayor grappling now with an attempt to get his budget under control by next October. So it's next year. That's an awful, as you know, when you have a half year to deal with, the cuts have to be doubled in size. That's a difficult, difficult situation to face. The answer is you do it in a progressive way. You forecast the force levels in different departments going a year ahead. You bring into bearing attrition. You may have to deal with some sabbaticals. You may have to look at other sources in order to help, in other words, that given department fulfill its function. You do all these in common planning. And the severity is not going to be less than extreme. I know it's going to be difficult. 
But the only way you get back on course again is to get the force levels in the city that will do the job. Well, well, it, there wasn't time to seek, I mean, when you did all of that up front, does that mean that the situation had gotten so bad there wasn't the time and the space at that time to sequence those, uh, well, sequence some of that out so it might occur over a longer period well, of time? a lot of things occur at once. The freeze on new hirings has to take place. The attrition process goes into play. Re early retirements are encouraged. And in a sense, you get the labor leaders, the ones who run the departments, to come in and suggest, what are the proper force levels that we can deal with? There's an input there. And that's when you set the ceilings on various departments. In terms of productivity, there are gains there. Those productivity gains belong to the workforce. If they can show productivity gains, it will bring down the cost of doing services, less overtime, or maybe a little less generous pension plan, that goes to the benefit of the plan instead of laying people. So all but those it, things it, take but place. But Governor, those weren't on your list. The things like the tuition in the in the city university. The, the, I'm, I'm, the, it, your list of horribles. That was long overdue. When we went down to see President Ford, and we said, we need your help. He said, you want my help? When my state university in Michigan charges tuition, yours don't. You're not going to get any help until you do it. So we were told to do it. And by the way, we, we have offsets. The tuition assistance plan for needy students offsets those cuts. So nobody's denied a college education, as you well know, in New York City for lack of means. That's the way it works. So there are offsets that you get as benefit when you impose tuition. The transit fare had to be done, but out of that transit fare increase, we got the ability in the system and put $6 billion into improving the transit system. So we have a better system now, as you have in Metro here. So there, are, there are offsets and gains as you begin to impose, as I said, these strictures. Yeah. That's but part of the planning it, it, process, which yeah, the, the mayor can't do alone. Uh, the, 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 your, your point is, uh, is an important one, though, that in order to get what you needed, you had to, on your side of the ledger, come up with a number of, of very strict changes for New York City all at no one time. Because the city had fallen into a pit, and the old rule in holes is when you're in a big hole, stop digging. You're getting deeper and deeper. So we had to say, that's it. The hole is too deep. And that's why we had to do the... Thank God, District of Columbia is not in that condition yet, but it's going to get there if you don't step in. I'd like to ask Mr. Regan, uh, uh, Controller Regan, about uh, a, a part of his testimony that <laughs> reads, if you change the name, it's the, it's the, it says the District of Columbia. It says, New York City's mid-1970s fiscal crisis was characterized by enormous short-term debt, huge unfunded pension liabilities, and severe operating deficits all worsened by years of shoddy accounting procedures and fiscal gimmicks. Anybody who's been in the District of Columbia for the last two seconds recognizes that as a description uh, that we've heard over and over again of, of the district. I'd like to particularly ask you about the unfunded pension liability. We have a huge unfunded pension liability. This was handed on uh, to the district at the time of home rule by the federal government, almost all the growth has been an interest of an actuarial uh, pay, uh, interest actually from what the government handed us. What did, what did New York do about its unfunded pension liability in particular? It, uh, by, with the help of actuaries, it was another one of the problems you can add to, uh, uh, add to the governor's uh, list. It was done all at the same time. There were actuaries hired and contributions had to rise. And I think it was amortized over in the case of the firemen 40 years and others uh, that weren't as bad, uh, perhaps a lesser, a lesser period. Once again, um, and, and it was just a great, it, it became part of the whole package. And I would echo the governor's words. Uh, you get all of these things done at once. And it's painful and traumatic, and uh, yeah, there aren't enough words, I suppose, to describe uh, wh what goes on. But when you hit the critical mass, and then everybody starts to give a little, you get you get the you get it done. So that's was simple. It was again, it's kind of the bonding out illusion. Future generations had to pay for the mistakes of those in the past, but it was worked out. Perhaps, a, yeah, perhaps an, an enactment which occurred during my terms in Congress, which is now in being, would be of help to you. Because I understand what you mean. When the Congress went for home rule or modified home rule, whichever you call it, uh, those unfunded pension liabilities were there before under the aegis and jurisdiction of the then federal government. And those are being carried on the city's budget now. 
I uh, recall that the ERISA program was put in effect uh, more than a dozen years ago. Where was ERISA? ERISA applies to the private sector. But why wasn't some function of ERISA directed to the city situation in the district and seen to it that the pension funds needed to fund out pensioners and retirees were properly provided for? Somebody would sleep at that switch. Maybe we go back to the federal government and say, you were, you were on the vigilance set at that time. You didn't perform your due diligence. Help us get out of this particular one. Maybe that can be done. Of course, at the same time, uh, a, a benefits maybe on a two-tier basis that seem a little rich. Again, that goes into the pot and has to be adjusted. Oh, on that note, we had a Kinzel Commission, again from the private sector, an accountant, an auditor who was very familiar, an actuarial expert with the Union Carbide Corporation came in, the governor had to face the recommendation of the Kinzel Commission, sure. and they were adopted. And to put a ceiling on reform pension, you couldn't enrich the pension by taking holiday time and bulking it in. Lots of reforms came in. I'm painfully aware of those because uh, there's a tier three which gives the least pension benefits in the history of New York State. The governor was put in tier three, and I've had to work hard ever since to offset the fact <laughs> my pension is so niggardly. Well, like, like, you, like you, Governor, the, the uh, citizens, the, the workers of the District of Columbia have already agreed to uh, very large modifications in their yes, pension I'm plan right. and have already agreed to a two-tier system uh, for new employees, but as of yet, the Congress has not stepped up to do its part. Right. Well, I'm aware of that. Thank you, Mr. Uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania. No, no, no questions. Uh, other than that, I would just congratulate both of you for your uh, involvement in uh, saving uh, New York City in a time of crisis, and your explanation and comments this morning are helpful. Uh, but I have no, no, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, gentlelady from uh, Michigan, Ms. Collins. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have any questions, but I have read the testimony, and uh, I thank the gentleman for coming to help us out of this uh, debacle that we're in. And as I said at the hearing last week, that perhaps what we learn here will help the other cities throughout the country, um, in particular my city of Detroit, Michigan. I, I still don't know what the answer would be with um, people using and enjoying all of the services of a central city and then going home to the suburbs or the surrounding communities where our tax base has fled, where the middle class has fled, the jobs have fled. So you leave a central city uh, derelict with no funds, but expected to maintain the same services. Um, what Governor Kerry said, you know, just made a lot of sense that you're expecting an awful lot of the District of Columbia to be the living room of America for all of the tourists, all of the citizens of America and the citizens of the world that comes here at all of the embassies, and yet we don't make allowances for helping us keep this living room up. I, I don't know. Um, I, I think that the board, the financial board, probably is the only answer, the good answer for the crises. But the, to me, that's not an answer for the long run. And, and I think that we also need to find answers for the long run besides the crisis. May I uh, respond to that? Um, Mr. Chairman, I... I um, was involved when you, when Wayne County assumed numerous uh, powers and involved with your mayor uh, at the time, uh, Mayor Young, because I had done the same thing in the city of Buffalo as we shifted powers, therefore taxes, uh, to Erie County. And of course, I watched the New York City experience and the commuter tax. In my own view, of my own experience prior to becoming controller, which was the city of Buffalo and Erie County, and my involvement in the shift of uh, some responsibilities off the Detroit tax base to Wayne County, all teaches me this and makes me uh, put forward this suggestion, 
that when the people in the surrounding areas, surrounding in Maryland and in Virginia, see that the city of Washington has done everything it possibly can, and you no longer have those kind of yearly headlines, uh, and which I'm sure the people in the suburbs love to chuckle about uh, uh, and, and decry. When that is gone, you will have created the atmosphere for a suburban tax or a shift of services or a combination of both. And it will never occur until you create the proper environment, but my own experience is once that environment is created, uh, and I'm not naive, uh, but people will recognize their broader obligations and will want to share and will participate. That day, as you well know, is a little bit off into the future. Mr. Reagan, uh, Governor Kerry, thank you both very much. Uh, I think you have added greatly to the dialogue on this as we move forward. I hope we can call on you. You've offered your services, and I'm sure we'll be uh, taking you up on that. We appreciate you coming before the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Um, at this point, with a vote depending on the floor, I'd like to recess the meeting for 15 minutes, at which point we will come back, and Ms. Fatah will let you uh, rep uh, introduce our next panel. All right, we'll be in recess. Congressional hearing on financial control boards will continue in just a moment. First, these programming notes. On C-SPAN's Sunday Journal, Senator Rick Santorum on Senator Mark Hatfield's committee chairmanship. Now, if we don't have an agenda, then leadership doesn't mean anything because you can go and do whatever you want, and that's leadership. 